Thank you, thank you um, everyone for coming. We are going to uh, have a wonderful conversation today with Dr. Cleo Monago. He has been with us before. I think most of you all know who he is. Um, let me tell you who I am. I always assume everybody knows who I am, but we have some new faces here. My name is Helen Higginbotham, and I have an organization that's called When Black Women Gather, and uh, we create safe spaces for um, mostly Black women to come together and pass on wisdom and tradition, um, things that we've gotten away from in, in life. And um, every now and then we invite other people in our community in to talk with us, and that's Black men. We've even had conversations with women, um, but always the focus, the topic is something that concerns us. Um, and the rule for any conversation that I host is that we must be uh, respectful. I guarantee you respect, but I don't guarantee you comfort. I think we're stuck in the quote unquote comfortable conversations and that's why we are where we are. Um, so the conversations that we have here, everybody has to be respectful, but comfort is not, if it's an uncomfortable conversation, my belief is that it's probably a necessary conversation. So that's the ground rule that we have here. So there's no bully, no name calling, there's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, you know, anything that's on your mind, ask it because you're thinking it and afraid to ask it, somebody else is thinking and wanting to ask the same thing. So there's no such thing. So that's it, right? So today, uh, what we're gonna talk about, which I love this title and I have to give complete props to Cleo. He came up with it, not me, I love it. Um, we are going to talk about um, unpacking anti-Blackness and packing Black self-love. That is so powerful. And, you know, Cleo's going to, you know, do the, he's, this is his program. I'm just kind of hanging out with him today. <laughs> I definitely want to know what people were thinking when you heard that title, because I just, it just blew me away. I'm like, that's perfect. That's exactly what, you know, I want us to talk about. So the question becomes, what do you all think that means? And we'll get to that. But um, let me tell you a little bit about Cleo. Cleo has two organizations. Cleo is um, CEO of the Black Men's Exchange um, National. And Cleo, is that in Baltimore? It's the headquarters are in Baltimore, yes. Okay, yes. And the Amasi, our center. And his focus is Black wellness and, and Black culture. And if you ever hear Cleo talk, what's the thing that him and I share is that what's first and foremost is that Black people are okay, that we're represented, that we have a voice, and that we're speaking to and for Black people whenever we can, and welcoming that Black people speak uh, up and for ourselves. And that's what we're going to do here today. But you all know Cleo from different programs and on Roland Martin. Somebody already mentioned that earlier. I know I used to wake up with him in the morning when they had it on TV One, and now they have the Roland Martin Unfiltered. He's been on TV One, Fox News, CNN, ABC, NBC, CBS, and he is, um, like I said, his, his focus is Black people. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So Cleo, yes. I ask you what, where you got that title from, or should we start out just by asking people what they thought the title meant and how it brought them here? Well, that always intrigues me, I think, though, before I what was implied or what was intended. Which I like to find out from people here what the title meant for them or what did it what did it spark at the people that are here. If you if you want to just speak up for right now, we can do that. If you want to raise your hand, that we can call on you. But um, or I can call out people. <laughs> uh, excuse me. My name is uh, Ken Carter, and I, this is my first year. I'm in New Jersey. I was invited by. Uh, Dr. Linda uh, McDonald Carter. Right. And uh, I was kind of excited to look at that title and, and respond to it because I too am interested in it and I've been doing some research and, and uh, I actually have an article that was uh, put out by the American Association, uh, the American Psychology Association. It was an announcement in uh, the 29th of October, 2021. It was a national apology to uh, black and brown people for the fact that uh, all of these years, way over a hundred years, that uh, they have, uh, and I'll read it here. It says, we apologize to people of color for the association's role in promoting, perpetuating and failing to challenge racism, racial discrimination, 
and human hierarchy in the United States. The association failed in its role leading the, dis the discipline of psychology, was complicit in contributing to systemic inequalities and hurt many through racism, racial discrimination, and the degeneration of people of color. Now, this so, so in a nutshell, Mr. Carter, we're just trying to get a quick answer. In a nutshell, your perception of the title said what? Well, it, what it said to me that obviously there are a lot of Black people who are anti-Black in their thinking, whether it's verbally or subconsciously. Okay. And this, this lends to that because this kind of negative inculcation is what we, 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 we war, war about historically. That's where uh, 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 the, the, what the Tom, what, what, what's the, the, the Toms came from. Because, okay. Yeah, so we'll come right back to, to you. Let's we'll try and get some other feedback on what anybody else, thank you. We'll come back. Okay. We're going to have a lot to contribute to the conversation. Did anybody else have a good reaction to, um, to what, to what the title meant? Yes. Um, good afternoon. My name is Donisha. I am in uh, California and my reaction was that um, the anti-Blackness and the Black love were tied to us as a people. Um, I feel like we talk about anti-Blackness outside of our race, our culture a lot, um, and maybe don't talk about um, the anti-Blackness that exists within our community. And so um, that was my first thought, that we're going to unpack the anti-Blackness that we have either for ourselves or for other people that look mm -hmm. like us, right. and then talk about the self-Black love, not just to yourself as an individual, but to ourselves as a community. Thank you. Thank you. That's exactly, uh, those are my thoughts. Anybody else? Real quick. I was just thinking um, that, you know, it meant to me we're always trying to fit in somewhere else other than accepting where we are. Okay. Thank you, Tracy. So Cleo, what was your thinking? Uh, um, what is your, where did the title come from for you? Well, it's pretty much in the title. Um, we are conditioned, and I'm going to talk about the variables of that moment, but we are conditioned on a daily basis, 24 by all types of to be anti-black. Anti-blackness is so normal, it's been mistaken for culture, black culture. And we need to start unpacking, as it says, anti-blackness and start packing in black self-love. So it's pretty much to the point, you know, this really, hopefully it was gonna be right there in your face, what the intentionality was without complication. So that was the intent to be clear and to the point as quick as possible. For me, the title anti-Blackness, um, I think so often that as Black people, we are complicit in our own oppression. So, mm -hmm. that's, so that's what it said to me that, um, you know, we, we think that, uh, and, and, and I don't know, those of you who follow me on Facebook, I have this hashtag that I use all the time, no to the double standard. And we'll talk about that and why I say that. But, you know, I think we have internalized um, you know, they say, stay in your place. I think some of us have internalized what that means to stay in our place. So when I heard the uh, anti, I mean, the way he packaged it for me was just like, yeah, that's, that's what I've been trying to say perfectly. Can I, can I jump Ellen, in? Ellen, I had a thought here? too. Um, I, when, when I heard the term anti-Blackness uh, as part of this, I thought about it in terms of as a society, not just oh, yeah. black people are taught to, to, be, to hate black people, that it's a societal thing. We are all conditioned in this, in this society. Everybody who lives in, in uh, the United States of America is conditioned to hate and disregard black people. And when black people buy into that, to that concept themselves, then that's where I get the second part of his title. Yeah, to me, the title said that we have internalized um, the oppression of ourselves. We are complicit in the oppression of ourselves with our thinking. And because time is limited and there's a lot to talk about, I also request, will request that people are brief. 
And I want to reiterate, because I'm not sure it came through when I was breaking up, that it's all right to disagree with me. It's all right to challenge me, but you have to be able to do it. You can't be disagreeable just to be disagreeable. You have to be able to back up what your, what your alternative perspective is so we can all learn from whatever you're bringing to the table. So I hope that's cool with everybody. And I'm ready to get started if that's fine. Okay. Well, before you start, can I say one thing? I hope you got you and Helen get back to Ken Carter because one thing I didn't think about the title much until Helen asked for what about what we thought of the title. But I'm really, really disturbed because as I what I think I heard Ken Carter saying is that he got a letter addressed to the Black Psychological Association. Mm -hmm. And now I'm thinking about all the harm implicit in what the Black Psychological Association did to Black people as it worked with Black people for however many years it's been in existence. So at some point, if you guys can get back to that too and address that, because I'm that has really broad implications for us and unpacking and getting to self-love. Thank you. That's it. Sure, sure. And I'll say now, because of time, that all systems all ologies, whether sociology, psychology, et cetera, are all built inside of a white supremacist paradigm. Don't forget religion. Just and religion. religiosity, if you will. Um, and e even language and linguistics, which I'm gonna talk about. The whole thing was built on top of the mythology of white people being supreme and everybody else, especially us being inferior. So of course the, um, paradigm of psychology, like all the rest of them, are going to not be helpful to us because what's helpful to us are systems that are designed specifically with the intentionality of waking us up from the anti-Black trance, making us critical thinkers to look at this world through a, this society through a critical eye and to intentionally make sure we're making decisions that are firm or advance Black people. So um, that's what what we should be doing in any paradigm that we're involved in should be doing that. If it's not doing that, we have a problem. For example, most higher learning institutions, including Yale and even some HBCUs, use a traditional academic framework for people to master to graduate. But often that system does have nothing to do with the affirmation of Black people, or if it's, if it's an option at all, it's usually an elective, like swimming. Or black history, you can swim or you can go to black history, but what's mandatory is white supremacy 101. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna talk about that in a moment. But before we get into that, I have some questions that I want some of you to answer and I'm gonna ask for a maximum facilitator. I think Helen or Chip, I don't know who's facilitating the discussion, but I need a, only a maximum of maybe three people to answer this. And I, and I need people to volunteer as soon as they can so we can get on with the conversation and be relatively brief. All right, the first question is, what is racism? First three hands, put your hands up and I'll call on you, please. And 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 Lisa, you guys and Nana, Nana, you're here. Barbara Ranson, go ahead. What's racism? Racism, it, racism is a systemic uh, cash. I would say castigation of one group by another group, which incorporates um, uh, power in order to effectuate a diminution of the, the group who was being affected by the racist behavior. Thank you, Barbara. Okay. Two more, real Anyone quick. Anyone else? Uh, Linda, what's racism? You talking to me or somebody else? Are you, Professor? Oh, man, you caught me off guard for a change. Oh. Uh, it's an issue of power that's assigned to something that's an artificial construct. That we're, you know, the artificial construct is that it's based on um, individuals' color primarily, but it's artificial, it's a social construct to maintain people in certain categories. So that's my quick answer. Thank you. You want to give me 30 seconds? One no. more, one more. Okay. Narlene, what is racism? Very, very quickly, what is so? It? Yeah, racism is a pretty much a system of um, of power over one 
race of people, uh, of one race of people over another, and also race, race and I'm picking backing on what uh, Linda said. It's a, it's a social contract. It's a social construct. It is not real. Um, so it is just um, using differences that visual differences that exist between human beings to discriminate against um, a certain group of people. And it is widespread. It is, it is part of the fabric of society. It's everywhere, um, pretty much um, in all institutions. Thank you, my love. Thank you. All Thank right. you, Nora. All right. It's, imp it's important that we define certain phrases that because we hear them all the time. And they've all, they're often misused. For example, the race, the term racism is often misused. You might hear somebody white say somebody black is being racist. You might hear somebody black saying that somebody black is being racist to white folks. And those people do not understand what the term means. The three sisters that defined it um, were very accurate in most cases. And I'll define it again. Racism is having the capacity to determine how people are affected economically, politically, socially, in every kind of way you can think of based on the construct of race. And in order to practice racism, you have to have power, systemic power. If you don't have systemic power, you can, you can not like somebody, you can discriminate, you can do what Helen says with this group, no white folks can come, but that's not racism. Racism would be somebody on Facebook saying, uh, I'm not gonna allow this, or Zoom saying, I'm not gonna allow this conversation to occur because I don't agree with it and then shutting you down. That happens a lot on Facebook in a lot of the virtual places where black people who are pro-black or black affirming are speaking. Some of them have literally been have been had their accounts shut down. That's systemic power and is typically done based on keeping whiteness in place and removing any kind of challenge to whiteness. So I want to, when we use the word racism, I want to make sure that we know what's being said and that we don't make the mistake of thinking that it's a general term that anybody can practice. Uh, white folks are the primary project, progenitors of racism and the creators of racism. And uh, some of us may know that race in, it, in and of itself is a construct. Mm -hmm. There's really only one race. Now there's different ethnicities. There's people from different regions, there's, but there's no such thing as anything but one race and white people who created the race construct with the purpose of putting themselves on top of it as the superior human group among everybody else. So are we clear? Yes, okay. we, we are clear, thank you. Okay, the second question, and I want people to work really hard on being brief on this one, because it's not talked about that much. So it's one of those things that can really start a tangent, but, but do your best here. What is white supremacy myth? What does that mean? And, and hold back if you've heard me talk about it before for a minute, and others who may have not heard you. We've heard the term white supremacy, where we have rarely heard it until I came along with the word myth added as a normal way of talking about it. What is white supremacy myth talking about? Chandra, I see your hand. Chandra? Um, yeah, so I'm just going to say it kind of goes back to what you just said when, because there's only one race, and when whites created the hierarchy, they put white, the white race, as supreme. So when I think of white supremacy, I think of white supremacy myth. Oh. The phrase is what is meant by white supremacy myth? Oh, I'm sorry, I missed. I'm not for sure. What well, I mean, the myth that white supremacy is, if it's a myth. Okay. Sorry. Thank you, Shana. No problem. No, it's all good. It's all good. Um, Pierre, I see your hand. Uh, yes, I was going to say the white supremacy myth is is definitely just capitalism. It's it's the way you know, the world is attempting to make us believe it needs to work, but it doesn't need to work that way. Thank you, Pierre. Okay. All right, Lenny, well. We have one well, more, La last one, Lenny. Very quickly, Lenny, please. Thank you. I was gonna say white supremacy myth says that the white race as, as defined by them is superior to all other races 
and therefore deserving of special privileges and rights because of their membership in that white so-called race. Thank you, Lenny. Phyllis Ellington, who didn't speak, but put a message in the chat has basically broken it down very clearly as well. The myth is that white, the white race is superior to other races. That's a myth. Mm -hmm. And I add the word myth. Thank you for that, Phyllis. Mm -hmm. I add the, and thank, and thank you all. I add the word myth because when we keep saying white supremacy, see what we don't often realize is that we have an unconscious mind and a conscious mind. Mm -hmm. Right now, while you're listening to me, you are in your conscious mind to the extent that you can do it. But your unconscious mind is working overtime because you've been trained to be schizophrenic. Mm -hmm. you're, You've been trained to hear, for example, I'm gonna give you a question that I want people, new people to respond to if possible. What's the opposite of pro-black? Anti-black. Any more? Pro-white. Okay. There are people in, in this group, of course, because they follow Helen who know what the deal is. However, as someone who travels the country all the time, and I'm always doing surveys with Black people in my work, as well as where I travel, a lot of people's knee-jerk reaction when they hear pro-Black is anti-white. Mm -hmm. so I'm glad somebody said that. That's not logical. Like someone said here, the opposite of pro-Black is anti-Black. But in society, we're taught to trivialize focus on anti-blackness and be concerned about being anti-white. For example, you may have heard black people say, don't come me with that black shit. I don't wanna hear that, I don't wanna hear that black stuff. Oh, y'all just militant. Y'all just, y'all need to, y'all need to stop blaming everything on white folks. Mm -hmm. Well, um, those kind of people who tend to say that tend not to have a critical analysis of the society that we live in and tend to be Race, tend to racialize Black people. We're trained to racialize Black people. I'm going to get to that in a moment. But I want to talk about white supremacy myth again to say that it is a myth that they're supreme. So we need to train ourselves to start to stop articulating white supremacy without adding the word myth or some other word to untrain us from even the unconscious consideration that maybe it's true. I call it the fallacy of white supremacy. Yes, that works as well. Now, what is the opposite of white supremacy? New people first, the opposite of white supremacy. Go ahead and speak up, anyone, since we don't have any hands raised. I'd say self-love inferiority. Sorry. Say that again? I'd say white inferiority. It's the opposite of white supremacy, okay? Anyone else? I think the opposite is um, that's equality for everyone. Realizing okay. that all races are equal. Pierre, thank you, Pierre. I, I would say reality is, is the opposite of white supremacy. Like, it, <laughs> okay. it, it, honestly, it's just, it doesn't exist. I, I don't understand no, I, why. I agree, I agree <laughs> with you. However, this thing that don't exist is kicking our ass. That's the thing that really doesn't, so, I don't understand it. I really don't. So we have, well, you, I think you will, I think you do understand it more than you realize, but you're going to be more clear about it before this is over. But the opposite of white supremacy is anti-blackness. White supremacy is already based on an inferiority complex, like somebody already said. I call them white inferioritists because the whole system is based on a almost serial killer level of social pathology that's based on a myth that creates the excuse to destroy and hurt others. But at, Black people are the primary target of white supremacy mythology, both locally and globally. For example, to use your cell phone and for it to work properly, to go to the moon, and often to drive your car, you, you have, in terms of materials and sources, you have to go through Africa first. 
One of the reasons why there's so many corrupt governments in Africa, and one of the reasons why people who are not corrupt, but about black people and Africans are always being destroyed, compromised, murdered and killed like Patrice Lumumba or Thomas Sakara or the marginalization of Winnie Mandela. It's because these people stood up effectively against white supremacy mythology. And the reason why it's important that black people are destabilized in Africa and in the United States is because we are needed as a resource for white supremacy mythology. And more recent than before, and we may or may not get into this, is that black people, and I want you to, first of all, I gotta say this too, I forgot to say this, look up everything that I'm saying, do your own research. And you can you even can do it during this conversation so you can challenge or get some clarification or disagree or whatever might come to mind. But I want you to understand that black people are important. And right now, as some people find this controversial, and we may get into this, Black people's bodies are used, being used as surrogates to genetically perpetuate white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Now, how? Am, what the hell am I talking about? Somebody tell me what the hell I'm talking about when I say that Black bodies are being used as surrogates to genetically perpetuate white supremacy. What am I talking about? I would, um, if it's okay, I would say that one of the ways, an example of that would be charter schools and how they're only in, you know, whoever controls your children's minds controls your culture, your economy, and your community. So that's an example to me because it'll be perpetuated for generations. And I've seen the impact for the last 40, since charter schools came into effect. I hear you. Anyone else before I, before I share what Almatu just said? So I think that um, it lends itself to all of the uh, body parts that the, the whites are using to perpetuate their own life sustainability. Moreover, yes. they're, they're taking out our, our genes, they're taking those genes and, and, and implanting them in people who got money and discard us. Right. Now, now I have some, I agree with you, and I have something I want to strongly suggest, which can be difficult when your mind, body, and soul is trapped in a white supremacy mythology paradigm. We're not going to focus except where it's contextually necessary on white folks. We're not gonna talk about how evil they are because that's redundant. They have been redundantly evil and anti-black and destructive to us all of our experience here. That's a redundant phenomenon. Even the attacks on David Chappelle recently are steeped in white survival agendas and anti-blackness and an agenda to silence black voices, particularly male voices, but not only male voices. So I want to make sure that we don't get obsessed with how horrible they are, not unless it's contextually important to where we're going in our conversation. I want us to look at, we're gonna unpack black anti-blackness and start packing ourselves with black love considerations. But I also want to make sure we're clear on that Black people are the most attacked people in the modern world. And I want to also emphasize that we have power. We have the capacity to deflect and resist all of this, but not without unity. And one of the reasons why there's a perpetual attack on, for example, during an election, Instead of calling on Dr. Tommy Curry or Julianne Malveaux or myself to give a political analysis of Joe Biden or to address Joe Biden, they'll get B, B, whatever her last name. What's her name? B, B something. B, what's her name? Somebody tell me what her name. I forgot it's B something. Whoever watches, I don't watch any of that stuff. I feel like she's a rapper and she, she, um, Party B? That's Cardi it. B. That's it. Oh, Cardi B. Oh. Right. We, 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 Cardi B, as opposed to a Black political scientist or social scientist, is who they'll choose to, to speak to them. You know, when whites, Asians, and other people are being interviewed, they don't get a singer. They go get somebody who actually can break down issues socially and politically, but they get Little Wayne for us. Mm -hmm. And then we get mad and we start talking about Little Wayne real bad, or start talking about who I call Obama, who y'all call Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm. 
but I call her Obama, and I'll get to that in a moment. Y'all, y'all get mad at these people, but they're decoys. They're just glad to be in the number and glad to be appointed, glad to make money, glad to be seen, glad to be relevant. They may or may not be aware of how they're being used. But we get mad at them instead of the puppeteer. We start calling, we hear the word coon more than we hear victim of white supremacy. We, we hear people calling them bed winches instead of very, very profoundly impacted human being of African descent who has been subject to the point of great control by white supremacist systems. And that's how we have to start, start looking. We have to stop re-traumatizing black people and rename calling black people, particularly in the presence of black children. We have to stop doing that. Anyway, I just want to be clear on the systemic basis why white supremacy mythology is a problem for us in particular. I'll close this tangent with, with bringing another phenomenon Can that I, we know about. Let me Go on, it real quick. Yeah, I was, sure. somebody, I was talking to somebody earlier today and he made such a wonderful point. I hope he's on this call. He should be. But what he was saying was that in the 60s, the people that we revered as leaders were really leaders. They were, you know, like you said, political scientists or even uh, you know, people who are in the struggle. And now we equate our entertainers to being our leaders. <laughs> like, you know, and he was making a great point. Like Denzel Washington played Malcolm X. He's not Malcolm X. You know, we look to, you know, but, but, but we do. And, you know, but even right. myself, I'm guilty because I had no interest in seeing the movie The Help. But when I heard that um, Viola Davis was going to play the lead, you know, be a part of it, then I had to change my whole perception. Like, okay, if she's going to do it, it must have some credibility. At the end of the day, these people are actors. And she actually regrets playing that role at this point. But for the most part, we, we give far too much credence to people who don't know anything. They're, you know, they're not in the struggle with us. They're, not, they're, they're getting paid. So yeah, anyway, right. I thought that was a great observation. But anyway, go ahead, I'm sorry. And I'm going to add to the observation that they're the people that we're saying are feed into it, et cetera. They're not the orchestrators of this. You know, little Wayne Pipe was at home sleep. And they called and said, could you come on CNN and give us your, your point of view? Because they knew it was going to be ignorant. So they called him. These people who are our leaders, we're not choosing them. There are some wonderful people in our communities that I know of who are social scientists, who are leaders, who are articulate and brilliant who can break things down in ways that'll be transformative and transbreaking for black people, but they get no press. White people choose who we call our leaders. There's a reason why our leaders are Reverend Al Sharpton, Reverend Martin Luther King, Reverend Jesse Jackson, Minister Louis Farrakhan, Reverend this, Reverend that, because, because Christianity is in and of itself a white supremacist trance-making phenomena that destabilizes black common sense and black spiritual clarity so these people are made to be the ones who get to be our leaders because they whether they are involved in, in the agenda not and often they're not in terms of their intentionality the church has become one of the biggest business in our community you already know yourself that you can go to black communities particularly working class and poor black communities and see a church on every corner and a church right across you from the liquor store, if not next to the liquor store, because the whole point is to keep us intoxicated one way or the other. And reverence come out of that stuff that we think is black culture, which is really white supremacy strategies that have been socialized, that we pimp because it, we can make money off of having a church. Ray, Robin, Robin has, the, has her hand up. Robin Vaughn? Yes. yes. Hi. Good, good Hi. evening, everyone. And thank you, Helen, for um, inviting me to the party every Sunday. And I'm just delighted that I'm able to make it this Sunday. But this is a, a very educational conversation. And we talk about a, a lot, you know, in all forums, with our families and friends, on social media, here, and more formal forums about, you know, the, the, the structures that hinder the progress of our race and uh, and gender in a lot of respects, which is yes. the, the basis of uh, Helen's um, uh, uh, a group um, when we, Black women gather, because I believe we are the most um, demonized uh, population on the planet right now, the most fearful, the most uh, folks who 
uh, that they feel threatened by the black woman for various reasons. And I just wanna give a shout out to the issue that's going on in the White House with Kamala Harris. Um, she may not be the selected, uh, you know, we may not, we all have our issues or, or um, concerns about her election, but nonetheless, she is the vice president. And right now she's under fire, right? Her office is under fire. And I believe that's the case is because there are probably some concerns about whether or not the vice, the president will make it through his full term. And now this woman is in line for the presidency of the United States. But nonetheless, that's another issue that we can talk about another day. But I wanted to talk about the constructs that you and, and, the, and the, um, the themes that you mentioned here today, uh, Cleo, and you talk about uh, uh, supremacy. But one of the things that I just wanna just throw in there uh, is around, you know, we all know what the what's are, I think for the most part, we talk about the what's all the time, mm -hmm. but what hinders the race is the how. How do we, how do we navigate this terrain? Because this terrain is not going away. The mm -hmm. oppressor is alive and strong and well, and power is never, Malcolm X, everybody has told us, no one, even uh, who was it, the, 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 uh, um, Frederick Douglass, I believe. Mm -hmm. Power is not going to, you know, folks aren't going to give away power. They're not going to relinquish it. You're going to have to take it away. Okay. So how Good do you point. take it away? How, what, what? So, so my, point, my point is, is that we have to start talking about the how. How do we overcome? How do we navigate? How do we break through um, or live with or, um, or um, uh, persevere? In, in the light of of, 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 um, of supremacy. But I think with supremacy, you gotta talk about uh, imperialism, uh, white uh, American imperialism, capitalism. Those are the, the things that you're really fighting is capitalism mm -hmm. and, and, and the, the who gets access to the money, who gets access to the political system, who gets access to the educational system, who gets access to the cultural systems in which those, those systems prevail. Okay. We, we are locked out of every single system. We are. So how do we get access okay. to them? That's all I'm asking. Sure. How do we get access? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Robin. You're all right. I always, I'm always long-winded. Sorry. That's okay. Go ahead, first Dr. of all, Leah. first of all, um, I know I don't, I, based on the comments I get, I know I don't look that old as I am, but I'm, a, I'm, 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 I am an old guy. I've been on this planet a long time, way over a half century. <laughs> I've been hearing black people complain about racism all of my life. Some complain about it beautifully, poetically, articulately, um, religiously, blah, 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 blah. And what I have not seen, Robin, enough is, well, let me, let me preface my comment by saying this. The accumulative effect of going in, going on 400 years of a lack of solution has had psychological effect over generations on black people. And because we have not done any fundamental resolution of what's, what's in a way of black progress and, and progressive black behavior and been running around with black lives matter signs doing all kinds of other stuff, we have not really gone from plan A to plan B or plan C, we're still at plan A. Hmm. So how, doesn't make a difference. It makes a difference. I want to be real clear. So let me, let me let me preface my comments with how it makes a difference. But telling people what to do won't work if they can't hear you. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why we can't hear each other, my perspective is this, Black people are in, are in a trance. Mm -hmm. Black people are, are in a intergenerational white supremacy consequential trauma trance. Mm -hmm. Even though there's other people in this, in this society, including Native people, who have gone through whatever they've gone through, they tend to be more resilient. And this to me clearly, I'm not talking about physical survival. I'm talking about cultural power. Mm -hmm. We don't have culture. We, now, I want to also say before I finish that sentence that we can resolve all of this and we have it all, all of it, all of it is inside of us. But right now we're not fully present. We don't know an insult when we hear one. Mm -hmm. We don't know anti-black behavior when we see it, which is why we're participants. For example, there was a song on the radio that you've all heard said, I'm living my best life. I ain't going back and forth with those N-words. There is no equivalent song in any other group. You're not going to hear 
Asians, Latinos, Jews, white gays, anybody say I ain't going I'm not going I'm living my best I'm not, I'm not going back for what you faggots, you kikes, you chinks because they have a sense of cultural clarity that as a domesticated people has been taken from us by displacement. We even don't we don't even know our, our, who our, what our real names are. They, they, every other group in this country knows who their real name are. So they're not in a, tr in a trance that's as deep as ours. So Robin, if I give excellent advice to somebody in a trance, it's the equivalent of what Nancy Reagan did back when she said, say no to drugs. <laughs> she said, she said, don't do drugs. But she didn't deal with the social determinants that led these people to want to anesthetize and not, and not feel anymore because they were in so much pain and the systemic white supremacy mythological horrors, including post brutality, unemployment, self hate, anti blackness, et cetera. They, she didn't mention none of that. All she said was, y'all need to say no to drugs. Well, to become happy enough or content enough not to want to anesthetize, you have to feel good about who you are in your body. I spoke at a conference before where this woman got up and said, why people keep letting themselves be homeless and let themselves be on drugs? And I asked her, I said, if you have to deal with racism every day, unresolved, do you want to be fully alert? Some people don't, they, they don't want to be fully here because it's hurt, it hurts. So the how is important, but if we don't, if we're not fully present and we're anti-Black, it's not going to make a difference that, that we know anything intellectually. We have to be emotionally clear before our intellectual capacity on behalf of Black people makes a difference. For example, mm -hmm. HBCUs in this country graduate most of the PhDs in this country. When I, I worked at a very powerful, well, not powerful, wrong word, a very well-known HBCU in this country, and I was a consultant to the faculty for three years. And one of the professors who had been there for 30 years said, inspired by the conversations I had created with my work, he said, we create great students. We create lots of graduates. We create people that do really well academically, but we don't create Black soldiers. Mm. Now, that's what I'm saying. We're, we're making people professionalize whiteness and master it to the PhD level and getting good jobs, et cetera. But in most cases, those jobs won't trickle down into the advancing of the collective of Black people. They become individual Americans because of the lack of cultural cohesion that other groups have compared to us. Helen? Can I, I just wanted to jump in there and say, I was speaking with someone last week on this subject, another person who made a really good point. Um, he was saying that his family all went to HBCUs and he didn't. And one of the reasons he gave the, and he says, it's all the same. He said, as long as your accreditation is coming from middle states or whoever, they are validating what your education will be. So whether you're at a black school or white school or whatever, at the end of the day, we're all getting the same education. So I push back on that a little bit because, you know, of course there's some curriculum issues. But I do feel that at a, you know, I'm a Howard graduate, so certainly at a black school, there, yeah, I got to throw that in there. There's a spin on it, right? I mean, I think that there is an awareness that comes, but even within those institutions, there is some complicity um, that goes with the white agenda, and and we're afraid of, um, you know, the quote unquote black agenda. And like you said earlier, you're militant, you're angry, you're this, you're that, and. You know, I think black people who, eh, we have to be very careful. If white people find you, my, my feeling is if we want, if white folks really want to see change, then stop choosing black people that make you feel warm and fuzzy. You need well, to choose people who push you a little bit past your right. comfort level. Otherwise, you're just, they're just going to rubber stamp what you're already putting out there. Well, what white people want or don't want needs to be relatively irrelevant to us. Okay. What needs to be relevant to us is checking ourselves yeah. and to find out how deeply contaminated by white supremacy we are or the system that we work in. For example, Howard University, which I'm only talking about because you brought it up, is, is the same school that co-marginalized one of the greatest Black minds of our time. She, that Welsing. was Dr. Dr. Frances Cress Wellesley. They fired her, exactly. Who, and, and she was one of the, and still is, mm -hmm. one of the greatest minds that ever reproduced 
in the African-American experience mm -hmm. and had all kinds of answers for us. Right. But, but she was purposely marginalized for mm -hmm. Skippy Gates and all kinds of other folks mm -hmm. who are what you just said, Helen. Rubber stampers. Uh, but these rubber stampers come from situations, including the trans state, that makes it seem like being rubber stamped is success. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our frame of reference for what success is, is how close and or farther we are to whiteness. Exactly. And that's like our success being based on how close we are to a cliff mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's about, that, that we're about mm -hmm. to fall off of. And that's and that's where we find our success is, is if we get any closer to that to that cliff. Right. But there's a lot of great comments happening while I'm talking in the um, sure. chat. Yeah. I'm hearing something about black people sold black people, which I know a lot about. I've studied the slave trade in, in great depth and been to all over the world where we were enslaved from the Caribbean all through uh, West Africa, et cetera, including Central Africa. So I know a lot about that. I hope that conversation comes to the surface because there's a lot of misinformation about that phenomenon too. And often mm -hmm. there's an anti-Black implication to how some of us talk about it because we don't really know the whole truth or we're not looking at it in context. But anyway, my next question is, but let me see, wait a minute, some wonderful comments are here. There was one that I just saw a moment ago that, by Shirley. Shirley Corsi, what did you say, Shirley? Uh, where is it? Shirley talked about the church. I believe. Uh, Shirley talked yeah. about how to... Yeah, I, I was saying, historically, um, the Black church that wasn't the current day, where a lot of these mega churches, their purpose, I just said, historically, um, that wasn't our purpose, even though I, heard, I read a comment I thought was good, too, this saying that it was allowed because, you know, the masters allowed it. and That's right and so forth but i still want to stand originally historically i still look at the black church as a beacon that's just my opinion i feel it was a beacon we, that if that's all they gave us we did something with that that was my point okay shirley let me respond to that real quickly of course we did something with it we do something with everything yeah you put it when you put it in black hands we're gonna do something with it particularly if it's all that we have. See, we have to start talking with full context and, and in some cases let go of our emotional attachment to anti-Blackness veiled in some, other, in some kind of pretty outfit, including the church. Mm -hmm. If you get a chance, go to the African burial ground in uh, Manhattan in the financial district of Manhattan that they accidentally found when they were digging up buildings to build some federal institutions. Mm -hmm. And you'll see in that burial ground, if you read any of the, or see any of the documentaries on it, because you can't see this stuff once you get there, that they had, a lot of people were buried with African spiritual relics. And African spiritual relics literally were Ill illegal in this society and if you were caught with them, you were lynched or maimed. In Haiti, which is directly connected, connected to us in terms of our desire for justice and against white supremacy mythology, in Haiti, and I mentioned them for a reason, they had a phenomenon called vo voodoo or voodoo. Mm -hmm. Now in this society, we don't know nothing about that. And all we know is what white folks said is that is evil, that is crazy, blah, blah, blah. Because if white people tell it about us, they're they going to make it sound like it's bad and horrible. And if, if the French caught you or the Spanish caught you practicing vo voodoo, you would be locked up in or murdered. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody just said they were Haitian, and I'm glad you're here. This is, what you have, this is what you have to understand is that Ooh, I get emotional about this because there's so much we don't know. Me too, Cleo. Haitian people should be, Haiti should be the equivalent of our Israel. Israel. Mm -hmm. As a people, but we're too, we're too confused and too deep in a white supremacy trance and too anti-Black or too worried about what white people are going to think to come up for air and breathe Blackness. But Haiti is the first place in the Western world where Africans, 
the Senate people got together and collaborated and said, we ain't having it. And it successfully conquered their adversary who, who had originally enslaved them, Napoleon Bonaparte, for one thing. And it was Dessalines and, and um, other people who involved men and women. But the more important people that we know about in terms of popularity is Toussaint L'Ouverture and Dessalines. My point is that the reason that they made they didn't want those people practicing vo voodoo is because voodoo spiritually unified black people and gave black people clarity and resistance. Mm -hmm. The people who built the citadel. Mm -hmm. Now, who's heard of the citadel? I'm not talking about Pierre. Who else has heard of the citadel? citadel? Most of us have no idea what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But you've seen Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. I heard of well, it. Well, some of us have seen Game of Thrones, not Helen, of course. There, there, are, there, there are edifices in game, the Game of Thrones that don't got nothing on the people that built the Citadel in Haiti. It's just as, but it's not a special effect. That stuff, that was special <laughs> effects in Game of Thrones. There is a fort in Haiti that's on the same scale as those mythical forms in Game of Thrones built by Africans who practice voodoo. Um, Cleo, I'm sorry. If, yes. I may, if I may add something. I, yeah, go ahead. And then I want to add something. Go ahead, Narlene, and then I'll add something. Let me say this okay, first um, before you add. Hold on, hold on, because I, I know you want to talk. I'm going to just say this. The point in that tangent is this. Someone said, I think it was Shirley, that they found value in the church. And then she also said within that same comment that this it was something that they let us have. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason I brought up voodoo is because they let us have it because they knew that it was a control device. That's why all of our leaders are Reverend this and Reverend that, because it's a psychological control device that makes us only go to a certain level of resistance and then we back off and don't complete the job. That's why we've been fighting against police brutality, the same police brutality all of my life and before my life, and we still fight against it because black people, part of our psyche is that to hurt white people in a way that is fatal is sacrilegious. Narlene, okay. Narlene, hello. Yes. Yeah. So this is what I wanted to add. I am also Haitian, and I also was raised um, um, in the church, raised Baptist, and all of that. All so, of that. in doing my research and growing spiritually and personally, and if you hear background in the background noise, I apologize for this. I'm actually walking, um, but I wanted to comment on this topic. Um, one thing about Haitians, and, and again, going back to religion, yes, they let us have it because that was a matter, a way of controlling us. We had in the United States, Nat Turner, initially he was allowed to read because he was only allowed to read certain parts of the Bible and read those parts of the Bible to the slaves to control them. That's right. But when he discovered other parts of the Bible, because the Bible at the end of the day, it is not it, it, I mean, I mean, it, it's a book that has everything in it. It is not. It is not a book without contradiction. It is filled with contradiction. That's why you can pick and choose whatever works for you, and all of that. It has some good spiritual teachings, but if you are going by the Bible, you by the word for word, it's it can get really confusing and create create a lot of problems. And we have seen that throughout the world. But once he discovered other verses that uh that did not support the the narrative the slave narrative he revolted and one thing i want to say about haiti when we had the big ceremony the ceremony of Bracaima, the cayman um uh, um the ceremony of Bracaima, i don't even know how to say it in english unfortunately um the cayman swamp and all of in that place bookman said a prayer and the prayer that he said and i had the opportunity to read that prayer i read it in creole the original Creole that he said it, and also in English. And that prayer was, uh, in a sense, said, God, God created the earth. God created the heavens. God, the God who gave us strength. You want us to do good, but the white man want us to do bad. He wants, and the white man wants us to suffer. Please give us strength in order to fight the white man. So to me, to me, it is very unfortunate that Africans, that black people 
who are the original people of the earth were led to believe that they did not have any spirituality other than that what was brought to them by the white men. And that was taken actually from, 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 a, from, a, from a country in the Middle East. They're not original in Europe. They're not original in, in, um, in, in France or Germany or anywhere, but rather in a country in the Middle East. And that was taken, that was adopted because that is what the Roman Empire did. Whenever the Roman Empire went into another place and colonized the place, what they would do is take on a little bit of that culture. So the Jewish people, they took on the, the religion. That's why you have the Christianity with, uh, with, with um, Constantine. It was all a political move. It mm -hmm. saddens me that we don't know that history, that we don't understand that history. And worst of all, we don't understand that we, are, we were connected as the first people. We were already connected to whatever we call God, source, whatever it is. We were connected to that. So, so, so I have this debate many times with people who are Christian. And I used to be, I used to call myself a Christian. And I used to rationalize it. And I had a lot of cognitive dissonance around that topic. But it's, it's, just, it's, just, it's just very unfortunate. Let's remember that we are the first and therefore we come directly from source. And no one, no one can give us any spirituality. We have it in us. And, uh, and I would add, Cleo, Cleo, I, I can add before you comment, real quick, real quick. Um, in the United States, what most people don't know, the first church, black church, or the first, I guess, ceremony of uh, opportunity to be in a black church was in Nantucket. And also at that time, before that time, the white people did not want black people to get in groups because they felt they would overthrow them or they would cause some kind of dissension. So when they finally allowed the black people to have church, they realized that that could be a tool. They also used poor white people to surround them while they were at church to make sure that they did not try to get together and overthrow or create some kind of dissension. So, you know, I would encourage people to look at um, why they let them, why they let black folks even practice Christianity on Nantucket in the first place. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Leah. Sure, sister, sure. And, and if you want to jump in, this is Shirley. Okay, but hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, please. One of the things that I want us to do more than anything with our bandwidth is talk about black people unlearning internalized white supremacy myth. Not the redundancy of the horrors that white people still do, are gonna always do, and are doing and have done. Some of that's gonna be relevant in transition to contextualize why we have to take care of ourselves better. But I don't want this conversation to be about what they did. The, the, the reason we're talking about the church is because someone br brought up the church in an affirming, an affirming way and they mentioned that they look at the church as a beacon. And I just want people to understand that the church is a consequence of the removal of black spirituality, which was a weapon of war against black common sense, black resistance. And that's just a fact. And I already said earlier before we got to this point that it's not a coincidence that instead of black affirming people, behavioral scientists, politically brilliant people who can break things down, being in our leadership is reverend somebody. Even back in the day, they killed Mac Malcolm first before they killed Martin because Malcolm's rhetoric was more dangerous to the white supremacy mythology crap that was in our head than Martin, who was a deep Christian. Talk about going up mountains with white girls and boys and all that kind of stuff. That was a lot more white supremacy residually than what M Malcolm was talking about. So people get upset about any kind of criticism of the church, but what people should do, even if they're upset with me, is, is show me where I'm, where I'm incorrect. Because half what I say, if not more, is not my opinion. It's a fact. And the reason I talked about the burial ground in Manhattan is because the artifacts that they found were living examples of by next to dead bodies of how they had to resist and what they prayed to when they were being destroyed. And we don't know nothing about those African artifacts because we have no, we're, we've been displaced. Cleo, can I just close by saying, since it was a kind of topic you pulled out, I 
I'm not upset and I'm a born again Christian. I've been through and, but I'm a thinker now. I'm a thinker. And I think because of this topic you're bringing up and because the black church historically and even today has a big, big, um, let's say impact on us as a people. I welcome this conversation. I welcome what Linda just said and the, the Haitian late American that I think because we bring up this topic, people like me and others, it's good. I think it's good that we challenge it, but I also think it's good that we don't throw the baby out with the tub or the water. I, that's all my point is. I think it's, I'm not upset. I think it's great. And I think we need more of it. So thank you. I, I'm loving it. And, and it sounds to me that we need to do a whole conversation on religion and uh, that will be another uh, <laughs> interesting conversation. Um, but I'm all for it. Um, that's what we're here for, to have the conversations that, you know, that people shy away from. We're here to have the conversation. And I'm just going to say, you know, I think the situation with us as a people and religion, and we're not going to talk a lot about, I hear you, um, Cleo, this is not what we're talking about. But I think that, you know, for me, the situation is we have a, a, a crazy kind of relationship because where we kicked religion out, religion gave us it, it, it was certainly put in place to, to brainwash us, no question. And we stayed enslaved because we believed in slavery. If you watch 12 Years a Slave, that poor woman, her life was worthless. And remember, she wants to die. She's begging Solomon to kill her because religion has taught her that if she kills herself, she's going to go to hell. So that's a whole nother thing. But yeah, so we, and Linda, we just be quiet, Linda, because I know you're biting a hole in your tongue. We're going to have another conversation. We'll have Cleo back and we'll talk about religion. <laughs> but um, Cleo, I see that uh, Itamal Lang has had his hand up for a minute. Can we get to him? Itamal Lang, we need you to be very brief. And Lenny, I, you're, you've already spoken. And I'm sorry, um, Mr. Can you help me pronounce the other name there? Cleo, Abu, Abu Kar, Abu Bakar? The other hand that's raised. Yeah, I see it. I don't Abu have my hand up, but I'm Bubaka, but uh, that's not my hand, so. Because yeah. I have my name, Ia Tahira, so. Okay. Abu well, Bakar is me. Tuba okay. Lang, was, wasn't he next? Yes, go ahead, Ituba Lang, and please be brief, Ms. Ituba Lang. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm going Hi, to be brief. Hi, sweetheart, how Justice are you? How my are you? Time anyway. um, <laughs> yes, thank uh, you. Uh, um, uh, thank you, Cleo. Cleo, I just wanted to ask you this question. What is it that prevents uh, African Americans to make a break, to make a break and say, Africa is full of culture, uh, traditions and identities and make a definite research at an individual level and say, I am going to embrace this identity. And I'm going to learn a lot about this identity that includes the language of these people so that I can have a complete link with Africa. What is it that prevents African-Americans to do that, to begin to have this self-love? What is it? Thank you. Good it's Tarzan. Wait, wait, let, let the Cleo answer the uh, question. Go ahead, Cleo. Yes, please, please let me answer it. Please let me breathe and answer it mm -hmm. and relax for a moment because this is important. Where's the brother at? Oh, there he is. At Tumalang. Tumalang. Have you have you ever heard the term Kafir? Tumalang. Which term? Kafir. Kafir. Oh, Kafir. Kafir. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. Okay, you've heard the term, right? T tell us real quickly what it means. Well, Kefa is a name that was used in South Africa um, during apartheid to denigrate uh, black people. Right. Um, by by uh, basically is an equivalent to a nigger. Is an yes. equivalent to nigger, exactly. non-believer, uh, and uh, yeah, basically, yeah. If okay, you know no, what the no. nigger means, then you know what Kefa means. Right. So now we didn't, 
we, me and his brother did not rehearse this, so I, but, I, but I know what's going on here and I want you to hear this. All right, Tuma Ling, do you all and, and, and Azania call yourself coffers as a normal practice? No. Black people, black people. No, African. we don't. No, we don't. It is an okay. anathema. It is an anathema. Okay. All right, yeah. now I'm gonna, I, I want you, you all to hear this because it's relevant. It even goes back to what the sister, what, what my point when I talked to the sister earlier who asked the how question and yours is a how question too. The reason that Africans do not call themselves kafir, which is the equivalent of the word nigger is because they have the cultural memory and the linguistic memory and practice still there that we don't have. They know in, an insult when they hear one. So unlike African-Americans, they don't call themselves Kafirs at all. They know it's an insult. Well, he's still, Tuba Lang is still connected to where he came from and has another frame of reference outside of pure white supremacy in terms of his worldview. People of African descent in the United States were displaced and taken out of that. And we don't know who we are. And we live in an anti-Black society and the official language is English and the official attitude is anti-Black. And everybody in this society, including Black people, speak English and speak anti-Black. And part of anti-Black is being, being anti-African. Part of sustaining anti-Black behavior is the word nigga, which we hear more than we have lunch. We hear it every day, all day. There's another term that you've all heard that where well, you've heard when you're, when you're angry that niggas ain't shit. Who's heard that before? Raise your hand if you heard that before. Everybody's heard that before. Um, well, there is no equivalent concept in Africa or any place else where anybody else lives. That's, that is a post-slavery unresolved woundedness of the black soul that is articulated linguistically. You ain't even shit, you're worse than shit. And when we get angry at somebody or at each other, that white supremacist notion will seep through our consciousness. But in Azania, which are, who you all know of in South Africa, the word kafir does not seep through their consciousness because they have rejected it. Mm -hmm because they have the cultural clarity and the li linguistic memory and usage to say, oh no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not having that. Mm -hmm. So in closing, in terms of your question, the reason we don't value what you just described in Tumalang is because we look at Africa as inferior, as um, something that is out of touch, uh, not modern, antiquated, and full of problems. But what we don't realize is, is that the majority of the problems that it's full of, white people did it. Right. Mm. And white people keep doing it because they want to control us and control our resources. So instead of saying niggas ain't shit, a word I don't use, I'm just saying to make my point, we should be saying white supremacy ain't shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. That's what we should yes. be saying. When, yes. we, when, when we see a, a Don Lemon or Obama, who y'all call Kamala, or a black person tripping, we should go. Why is the premier you see? Look, 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 look what it does. Instead right. of beating up Kamala, Don, and a whole list of people who are acting anti-blackness out because they were selected and white people knew they could control them because they knew that they were traumatized into submission. Mm. They're controlling this agenda. They're controlling this, but we're mad at black people. I was on a, I was on a talk show the other day that was in response to the, um, the David Chappelle thing. And this person who calls themselves trans said, I'm so tired of black men blaming uh, white supremacy and not taking responsibility. Well, that's a, that, that's a great example of inadvertent anti-blackness because we don't even wanna look at cause and effect. <clears throat> we don't even want to look at cause and effect. We want to just be mad at Black people at all costs, which is a symptom of enslavement and generational unresolved trauma. And the word, the N-word 
bolsters and perpetuates the implication that we ain't even human, we're a race. Sit your black ass down. You black MF. Uh, that's all normal in the black culture and it's all a direct consequence of, 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 of racism. Now somebody, and white supremacy, somebody just said something that I want to address. I think it was Shirley who said that I'm disrespecting um, Kamala. Oh no, I think so. And all I'm going to say to that is this: I, I I know how to be. I don't. I don't practice it. It's not my norm. I know how to be disrespectful and say some stuff about Kamala from a place of anger and rage. So I'm not being disrespectful, in my opinion. I'm contextualizing Kamala, but that's offending some of us. Now, what might be helpful, particularly when you talk to somebody like me and the other black people, is ask us why we're saying what we're saying. I just want to say instead of simply being offended, mm -hmm. ask why we're saying what we're saying, because it might make sense. It might not make sense. But right now, there's an emotional reaction to something that has not even been explained. Right. I didn't want to make it emotional because that wasn't the topic, you know, but let me I, let me say that no, the topic, want... the topic, no, the topic, let me, let me say this real quick. The topic is just being disrespectful. Mm -hmm. The topic is me potentially in somebody's eyes, maybe yours being a uh, hypocrite. Because I'm saying not to be mean to other black people, but I'm calling her Obama. Well, to me, Obama is not an insult; it's a description. But I'll get to that in a moment. I want to hear what Helen has to say. Then I'm. That, that's that. look. We got some controversial calls, and, and Shirley, I, I look. I look to have you there when we have that call. But what I was going to say is that we have internalized. We somebody asked me yesterday they would tell me that they're going to do a presentation at their job to white folks about diversity or something, and that he was going to pose the question, can black people be racist? And what I said to him is that's not the question. The question is, have black people internalized white supremacy? That mm, is the, the question. question. And, the and question. many, and you know, even you know, I can say we because like subconsciously, yes, we have. Yes. We, it's been ingrained in us from the day that we got here. If you're educated in this school, in our schools, from the day that you step foot in kindergarten, they're working on your psyche. And when I hear people say things like, um, you know, here's something for you all. When people say, oh, I got to work twice as hard because I'm black. That's bull crap. I don't have to work any harder than Becky. That's how I feel. And there are laws in place that say that you can't treat me differently because I didn't work as hard as Becky <laughs> and we can dance in court if that's what you want to do. But when we say things like that, like, oh, you know, you know, um, you know, uh, um, Henry stole, stole $10,000. Now, mind you, as a politician, right, the white politician probably stole 20 times that. And he didn't get the trouble in trouble. But, you know, what do we say? Henry should have known that he shouldn't have done that. When we say things like that, we are internalizing white supremacy. We are accepting that there is some double standard for us and that we know our place. We are accepting that there is a place for us. And I'm saying that there isn't. And we need to be able to challenge it and not be afraid to challenge it. I don't need to work harder than anybody else. And if Becky only got a slap on the wrist, then damn it, you're only going to slap me on the wrist too. And if you do something other than that, I'm here to challenge you. And what we have to do is support each other. So when, you know, Helen steps out and says, nope, you can't treat me differently. Don't be laying in the cut because you think you're going to get a big piece of cake because you sold Helen down the river, you know, and, and in public, you don't want to talk to Helen until you find yourself in the, in, in, the, in the bad situation. And then all of a sudden people like Cleo, like Helen, like Linda Carter, you know, you, you run to people like us. You can't do that because you're allowing yourself to be um, manipulated in the system. So we have internalized some of this stuff and we have to, when we hear it, when you say I'm not, you know, you bought um, bad groceries from so-and-so store, so you're not going to do any black stores anymore. Who says that? White people don't say, oh, you know what? That white grocer sold me some rotten onions and I'm not soft shopping at any more white stores than only us. So where do we get that? So when you hear yourself saying these things, you need to just put, you know, put a pause on it. Now, what we can do is say, hey, look, Mr. Black Grocer, let me, and we need to do it to everybody, but particularly to our own. We need to call each other out. If you're in a job and you're and you know that you know Sally or um, I can't think of her sister's name, but okay, maybe a sister. Aniqua, 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 okay. 
<laughs> but if we if we know that she is it, or or you know if a black person in charge is is not looking out for us then we need to call them on it we need to stop protecting one another uh, and anyway that's just my thing we've internalized white supremacy and that's what i think cleo is saying that we need to unlearn all of that stuff i think that's what you're saying right cleo um, can um, i know something uh, before, can cleo I... and helen before i go um can i just say this um i think what cleo uh, is raising on this notion of is it called Obamala? Is it, is it, is it how you say it? Obama. Obama. Mm -hmm. oh. oh, yes. Um, in, in, in South Africa, um, we have this liberal, uh, South Africa is a multi-party country, or we've got a multi-party democracy. So we've got this liberal um, party called the Democratic Alliance. And uh, what it did, because it needed to get the black votes, it then started going through uh, one of the leading uh, black consciousness uh, leaders, uh, uh, Professor Mampela Rampela. Um, and of course they discarded her immediately because of she was not um, uh, buying into this white um, uh, liberalism. But then they found another man called Musimaimani whom they, they, they made him into their so-called uh, uh, progeny. And, and of course, uh, uh, because Blacks called it what it is, that they were putting a Black face to gain Black votes. And this is, this is what we've got to be conscious of as Black people that uh, as we see black folks uh, in, 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 in political uh, leadership, we have to understand the, the, the power, the colonial power behind it that creates these beings to, 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 to lure us, to, to make us believe that, you know, unless you, you, you identify and construct your identity within that which they want you to be, uh, 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 um, you, you, you won't make it. And so we've got to resist that. Uh, uh, and and I, I really wonder in the United States, what prevents African-Americans to even come together and start their own political party? What prevents African-Americans to mm -hmm. say, we are resisting and rejecting the entire system and we are going to do our own system uh, uh, within the system, uh, you know the American Constitution. Of course, you are aware that the Constitution was never meant for you. But at what point will you ever use it as a tool to achieve that emancipation? Will it be just a document written? Or will you ever, as African Americans, begin to say, this is a tool that we are going to break down the American empire mm -hmm. within. You are within the belly of the beast and yet you are sitting comfortably within the belly of the beast. At what point will you ever stand up for yourselves? Africans are doing it. We are doing it in the continent. We are fighting in the continent. We are resisting Chinese imperialism. We are resisting American imperialism. What prevents you from reject, rejecting it? What prevents you from saying it's time to decolonize Western uh, North American epistemological paradigm? What is it? I, I'm hearing this notion of a, a black psychologist. When are you going to begin to reject even your very own by saying we cannot and we will not be associated with this? Thank you. You know what will be, you know what will be great, Helen? Yes. Is if is Itubalang Motoagu or Age and I had a conversation with your group about what he's saying. Yeah. Because it would be very, very educational because he's asking um important questions and the answers are key and they should be articulated. Um, I am doing something in, as a part of a, a new process with your group to attempt to unpack some things. But, and I'm gonna get to that now as a direct thing, but people wanna chime in. They always, people, people have things to say. People yeah, are offended. I, yeah. people are offended. I just people wanted are, to say- People are offended by some things. People are interrupting me. 
<laughs> and all kinds of and all kinds of things. And it's like to get to what this brother Zephyr is talking about, which is which is fundamentally necessary for us to, to be free of this stuff, we have to understand why we have to understand the answers to his questions. And we don't. And, and, and even I and I've already unpacked some of it. I talked about that he, for example, understands cop fear. He y'all heard him say cop fear meant the same thing as nigga. He talked about, and I talked about how we do not use word, they do not use words that de defile them on a normal basis, even in love songs. You're not gonna hear my favorite kafir on the top 10 in, in a zanya because they have more respect for themselves because they know who they are. We have we have some um, resurrection work to do in terms of black self-concept. There's some things, some work that we have to do that, I, that, I'm, that I'm prepared to talk about, but it can't get done until we start doing the trance breaking work. Our whole brain and, and, and our whole impulse and, and way of looking at the world is wrapped in poison, you know, cloaked in a white supremacy paradigm. We have to step out of that paradigm to even consider the sensible things that Itumuleng is talking about. He keeps asking why. The whys are very, very important. And often we don't know the whys. Matter of fact, we perpetuate unconsciously a lot of things. And for example, um, when Hel Helen said something and even um, and Tuma Lang said something, he said that we were comfortable. You didn't say that, Helen. I'll get to what you said in a moment, but he said that we were comfortable. But we are. I, I, work, I work in healthcare. We ain't comfortable. Hmm. We're not comfortable. We are familiar. And we're getting familiarity and comfort mixed up. We're not, we, we're not. Are, we're we not are we complacent? We're in a trance, which is different from complacent. Okay. We're, we're, when you're in a trance, you're not even fully embodied. You're not even fully present. We're on, we're on automatic pilot on behalf of white supremacy mythology, not on behalf of black power, not because we're deficient, not because we're stupid, but all we know is white supremacy mythology. In February, when black history comes up, we're not gonna learn about Akhenaten and, or Hatshepsut. We're gonna learn about Harriet Tubman and a whole bunch of people that was running for white folks. In, as enslaved people in the United States of America. We don't even know where we came from, the, the, the profound history that we are connected to. We, have, we think we're just niggas. Sit your black ass down. And I'm telling you, this is a problem. When I worked with children at the Gateways Mental Health Center in Los Angeles for some years, I worked with chil black children who had been molested or abused by adults. That's who that was, who was on that was who was on the wing that I worked on. Those kids were Asian. Those kids were Latino. Those kids was white. Those kids were Jewish. The only children that saw their abuse as something that N words do, and who racialized their abuse was the black children. Now all the children are going through the same thing. I, I might have said this already on your show, Helen, but I'm going to say it again. So people can see what I'm saying, what we have to unlearn on a fundamental basis. I talked about maybe that I was speaking at a university and I asked the white folks to stand up and you kind of spoke to some of this already, Helen, uh, in terms of what you were saying. I asked the white folks to stand up and I'm gonna make this story real quick to get to the point. They stood up and I asked them, has you been to Bank of America? Has you been to Walmart? Has you been to Kinko's, a bunch of white businesses and had bad service? And they said, yes. I said, did you say I'm not going to those honkies ever again? Did you say, these crackers can't never get it right. Did you say white people just can't get it together and thought about and said, I'm never going back again? And they looked at me like I was like, really? I mean, are you asking us that? And I'm like, and I sit there calmly like, yeah, and I'm waiting for you to answer. Of course not. Then I had the black people stand up. And they were scared. They were, these were faculty members of a, of a university, an Ivy League university. And they thought I was going to shame them because they know what we do to each other. And I said, after I asked them to get up, I said, I gently said, sit down. I'm not here to shame you, but you know what I'm talking about. And they said, yeah. I said, look at what it looks like for people to never get mad enough 
at their people to dehumanize themselves and their people, period. They could have been a victim of a white serial killer. They still not going to say what white folks do. And, and even, even white women who have been battered by or disappointed by white men, and there's millions of them, they don't say white men have messed up. I don't like white men. They don't racialize themselves. We have been racialized and we racialize ourselves. That's why we have black asses to sit down and, and you black AMF, blah, 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 because we, we got, and, and we can't do what the sister who talked about how, we can't do what Etuba, Ring, what Etuba Lang suggested until we come out of the white supremacy trauma trance. That's why I went back to Nancy Reagan and said, she said, say no to drugs. It had no impact because she didn't talk about why people take drugs. Something else that Helen said a moment ago about people saying you got to be twice as good. She's saying, I don't got to be twice as good as Becky Effa. You know, there's laws that say I don't got to do that. But it's a part about this that's important. This gets to the psychological part in the trans state. Mm -hmm. There are Black parents still lovingly saying to their children, but you got to be twice as good as a white man. Mm -hmm. And what they don't realize that they're doing is implying that they're twice as bad. So they have to compensate for that by being twice as good. What they should say is you have to work very hard because there's a corrupt system out there of white supremacy and sanity that's wrong. Not you, baby. You're not what's wrong. It's, that, it's a system out here that you can actually get past and navigate through and do well. But they're gonna be, there's going to be people going to be challenging you because they have a problem. We don't tell that part to our children. They don't hear that they have a problem part. They think, along with hearing N-word all day and, and all that stuff, that we're the problem. And then you have them bringing in uh, the, the, the dude with the teeth and the, and the locks. I just mentioned his name earlier, the, the, the so-called rapper. Um, I said his name earlier as an example of who they call Little Wayne. Little, Wayne. Little Wayne. Then we hear Little Wayne saying, racist, we, ain't no, racist is not an issue. And then our whole capacity to have common sense, which is why they put these people on, you know, on TV, is interrupted by these confusing messages. And we don't speak to our children to get them prepared mm -hmm. to live in a society and to thrive. One more example, because I know people got their hands up, but I say this because this is part of the answer. And I might have said this on the show before, and I see that battle fatigue, so, but the, the, the battle fatigue can be changed in a minute if people are motivated to just do the right thing. You've been tired before and somebody said the right thing and you was ready to go party because it was emotional, that so-called fatigue. But um, I told, I might have told you before about well, after Dylan Roof murdered those people, shot 12 people. We forget that it was 12 people that got shot in Maine and nine died. To make a long story short, I was traveling across the country talking to mental health professionals and I was at a conference where there were thousands of mental health professionals, people who had been trained to, to work on mental health issues in terms of resolution. And I asked the people in ours, could I, speak, could I ask their children the question? And I said, if, if you think my question is inappropriate, I'll stop, I won't go any further, but I want your permission first before I ask them this. And they trusted me, they said, okay. I asked these babies and they were from the ages of like two to 15, 16. I said, do you all know who Dylan Roof is? And this was only, when I first did this exercise, this was only like a week after Dylan Roof did what he did. And at least 70% of the children knew who Dylan Roof was or is. I said to the parents, I said, that any, these are the mental health professionals now who've shuttered Freud and, and Jung and psychology. I said, did any of you take your child to the side and check in with them and say, baby, are you all right? Um, how did that impact you? Um, I just want to hear from you because that, that that's a horrible thing that you just saw. And it was clearly something that had to do with black and white and black people were murdered. What do you think? And the majority of those people did, hadn't done that. They hadn't, they hadn't created space with their children to engage something that was high profile that traumatized them for being black. And the other powerful thing that, that occurred during that interaction was the boys, some of the boys started crying mm -hmm. because they were sitting on unresolved, unarticulated trauma and told to be a man and be a boy, you know, don't cry and all that kind of stuff. So they were, they had, they were, they were internalizing all this stuff that they wound up in some cases taking out on other black people, including domestic violence and all kinds of stuff that people do when they are a child and they grow up to an adult with unresolved rage. 
So we cannot do the how until on a macro level, we unlearn some norms that come out of the protection of whites. I can't tell you how many mothers, sometimes fathers, but usually mothers call me and say, my child was just experienced racism at her school and I don't know what to do. And I stayed calm, which is one of, which is one of my strategies, never good being emotional. Somebody already said we're too emotional and we, we're too emotional because we're too repressed and we're acting out a bunch of unrepressed, un, unresolved stuff. I said, um, why do have why haven't you talked to her about these issues? Well, I don't want her to be I don't want her to be angry, so I haven't talked to her about racism. I said, okay, so what happened to her? Well, one of her classmates called her a nigger. I said, okay, and you haven't talked to her about the fact that that was a possibility on planet Earth and that this is a phenomenon that occurs in the society, and taught her about her wealth and her value so she can look at that and go. They tripping instead of internalizing and coming home crying to you. Why have you not discussed these issues with her? Because I don't want her to be angry. And I said, and this was the deep part of the conversation, angry at who? Mm -hmm. Because there's somebody angry at her, so angry they calling her a nigga. So who do you not want her to be angry at? Angry at who? And it's and it's that unhad conversation that fuels a lot of black emotionality and dysfunction because we're sitting on so much and y'all know who y'all know who she didn't want her child to be angry at white folks mm -hmm. so she's and this is not on purpose just like these black msws masters of social work students that were in this audience they weren't ignoring their child on purpose earlier today helen and i were talking about the film the help the help was a problematic film but one of the things that it shows, which is based on fact, is that the maids would spend all day changing black, white babies' diaper, nurturing them, combing their hair, and loving them. And when they got home, they were tired. And they told Leroy, bring your ass to bed. I'm tired. Mm -hmm. So by the time we get to each other, we've been spent because we spend so much time on constantly taking care of white folks. Another example is... We still whisper the word white. I'm sure Helen's heard somebody do that. We'll be we'll be in a we'll be in a room full of nothing but us. We'll go. You know there was this. That's that's a white. We have we, that's a white protected behavior, and that's a black silencing behavior. We cannot be free. We cannot be liberated. We cannot do the things that the brother from Azania suggested, which are which are intelligent things until we come out of the white supremacy trauma trance that we're in. We have to be able to be confidently and unapologetically in love with black people, unconditionally. Because we like white people unconditionally and hung and killed and murdered and did all kinds of stuff. And we're still doing duty for them. We're still whispering. We need to learn to love ourselves in our own image and unlearn the mythology of white supremacy, it's a myth. And anti-blackness is based on myth. Like somebody said in this conversation, um, we, are the, we are the first. I mean, see, don't get me started because I'm not just talking madness and just trying to be a militant. I've literally researched what the hell, excuse me, to be more professional. <laughs> all good, it's all good. I've literally, I've literally researched what I'm talking about. All right, Robin, thank you for your comments. I know you have to go, but I hope I, I hope to hear from you again, sister. So we can talk some more about that, about that how that you talked about. But the bottom line, y'all, is we have to unlearn some anti-Black norms. One anti-Black, and I'm getting into solutions now because time is going by and we have to end soon. We have to stop calling each other the N-word. We have to start respectfully challenging people who said and explained to them why it's problematic. We have to remember what the brother from Azania said. He told y'all, we didn't rehearse this. He said that kafir is the same word as nigga that came from the Danish who initially oppressed and colonized them. But they don't call, they don't call each other kafirs because they still have linguistic and cultural memory. We have been taken out of our cultural memory and put into a white supremacist vicious 
phenomena that has us at each other's throats instead of the throats or the system that has us in the strait that we're in. We have to learn our history. We have to know what we have contributed to, to human, human history. We have to learn that information, which I can't get into the details I would like to tonight. And one day Helen's gonna have me back to, to, to be very specific about black African triumphs in history. I already mentioned Toussaint the Overture in Dessalines in Haiti, who built a fort and a resistance system against white supremacy that was very, very successful. We have to learn <clears throat> the truth about slavery. One of the mantras in our subconscious is that, well, black people enslaved black people. Now, I think it was Pierre, <clears throat> I could be wrong, who typed that in the um, chat. And I want him, I want, I want him to appear here so I could talk to him about that and find out what he's talking about. Because this is important. As I said, Pierre, is, Pierre are you still with it? us? Okay, yeah, go ahead. With okay. You. As I said earlier in this conversation, we have a conscious mind and we have an unconscious mind. <clears throat> our conscious mind is listening, but our unconscious mind is advocates for the perpetuation of white supremacy and anti-blackness. All those conversations that we have not had or those wrong, wrong conversations that we've had where we try to find an excuse to be anti-black is part of why we become paralyzed, let alone the church teaching us that to fight against racism is sacrilegious. There was a woman in my, in, in my class in Los Angeles who was a 60 year old black female minister who said at the end of the class, it was a three day retreat. She said, finally in my life, I can advocate for black people without feeling guilty and without feeling like I'm doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. Because she was trained that mm -hmm. to even care only for black people was racist mm -hmm. and against God. Mm -hmm. This is what she said. So we have to unlearn a bunch of BS and find out why our spokespersons, for example, CNN has three, I call it the Caucasian News Network. CNN has three black men with their own show. There's no such thing as a accidental pattern. If it's a pattern, it ain't no accident. Van Jones, um, um, Don, Don Lemon, Lemon. And there's a tall um, comedian with an afro whose name I always oh, forget. Oh, come out, come all. Yeah, him. Mm -hmm. Now, wh why do these three men have something in common? Who gonna say it? Come out, bear. What do they all have in common? There's th there's 50 million black men they could choose, but they pick three who. Well, have they all have white partners. They all have ones? white partners. All okay. three. Of them. And they're they non-threatening. All, they're non-threatening. They all are in love with white people, mm -hmm. they love them, mm -hmm. literally. And that's why they get to have a show. The reason they got rid of Roland Martin is because Roland Martin was not somebody who was gonna wind up spending his personal life in the, in the presence of white folks for, on behalf of white folks. And the majority of black people who get to be household names in our, in our world are people who have no opinion, people who are anti-Black in their personal lives, or people who are neutral. Well, why would you be neutral when you're part of a group that's under attack? Another thing they do, which a lot of us don't see, is right before Barack Obama's presidency end, they got rid of all the black people in the press. They got rid of Tavis. They got rid of um, Harris, something Harris that was on MSNBC. Oh, State. Melissa Harris, Melissa Harris, who, Harris. Paved, who paved the way for um, the young lady that's there now. They, that, they got rid of all Melissa's, those people. Right. So the question, the question I have for you all, this is part of your, your homework, because you have to become a critical thinker, is what's the difference between Tavis Smiley Roland Martin, who's also taken off of main, mainstream mm -hmm. television. What does, what's the difference between Roland Martin and, well, more, more directly, because Roland Martin had this some complexity there, so I'm gonna take him out of the equation. What's the difference between Tavis Smiley and um, Melissa Harris-Perry 
and Joe and what's the sister's name? Joe. Joy Reed. Joy Reed. Joy Reed. Now Robin said, "Who cares what CNN is doing?" I'm gonna write that down because I got I got to get I got to respond to that. Um, what's what do they have? What, what's the difference between Tavis, Melissa Her Paris Harry, whatever Melissa Paris, Paris Perry, Perry, and Joy Reed? Okay, I'll be I'll get quick because of time. Joy Reid, like Barack Obama, does not come from a traditional African American cultural mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. They do not create in them, in the presence of white people, post slavery anxiety mm -hmm. because they have a different history. So they prefer people like that, like the HRC, which is the the Human Rights Campaign, which is a huge white gay organization. Um, had a for the first time in history had a black man as the president. He too, he was from Liberia, and had a remote, controlled, distant relationship with the history of black people in this country as people who had been enslaved. So he don't have that energy. He don't have that that way of de dealing with the world. That's one of the reasons why Barack Obama was a, was perfect because he was half African, not half African American and have white. See, we need to understand not simply the dirt that they've done, but we have to understand their strategies mm -hmm. because we keep not getting it. I on, on national television, I said, because I understand how white supremacy worked, that Kamala Harris was gonna be the president of the United States or the vice president, one or the other. I was wrong about the president, but she became the vice president. And I knew that when Biden was the one who was gonna choose the black woman that he was pressured politically to choose, it was gonna be the whitest one out of the group. He, and, and, and one of the things he articulated was some of you heard was I ain't and her neck was doing all of that. I ain't gonna be work, doing nothing just for black people. She said that. She, she absolutely did say that. And with all the disdain that she could muster, and if you haven't seen the video, I'll be happy to send it to you. I think she's being, well, I forget the organization. Was it the Grio who was interviewing her? And it just, right. ooh, it was not good. But anyway, well, go ahead, Theo. There's some Theo. people who are disagreeing with me and, and I want to, I want to address them. Mm -hmm. Somebody said, I was with you until you did something. Come let me let me read that. I was with you about CNN, but when it comes to Joy Reid, I'm sorry, Cleo. You need to well, watch. Joy Reid is not on CNN. Joy Reid is not on I CNN. Know. But she is. You said there's no more uh, since uh, Biden. There are no more black, you know, host and commentator. I would say the exception to that rule has to be Joy Reid. Okay. See, th this this is the issue with disagreement. Well, I didn't, I didn't say that that was my opinion. What I said was Joy Reid is not from the African-American experience. She's part, she's part West African and Caribbean, and that's her background. That's what I said. That's a fact. So what are you disagreeing okay. with? You were saying, I thought you were saying there's no, you know, on partly I agree with you about CNN, but I thought you were making a general statement across the board there was no one that you would challenge what's happening now. And I would, if that was true- I, I didn't even talk about what, whether people would challenge what's happening now or not. What I said was there's three men who have a show on CNN and they all three have white partners and there's, there's no such thing as an accidental pattern. That's on purpose because they literally love white people. Therefore, there will be a threat to white supremacy mythology because they literally, they, they, have, they have in laws and White people are part of the backdrop of their lives and they literally love them. So that's why they get these shows. Then I went to the issue of culture beyond race. And I talked about Tavis Spalley being an African-American, the descendant of enslaved Africans. I can keep messing this woman, Miss Harris, messing her name that, that she comes from in terms of a part of her parentage from people who are enslaved and how they put, prefer people who are not the descendants of slaves, but who look black to be in positions of influence because they're not, they don't have the, the slavery born anxiety that's between African-Americans and white folks. They don't have that. I'm that's trying to I recall said. a conversation. So I, 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 I will Shirley, agree. Shirley, wait, 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 stop. 
I'm trying to recall a conversation that I heard with um, Greg Carr and on his Saturday program with Karen, Karen Hunter. And they talked about this and I think he was quoting somebody, but it was a term that's used for black people who are not of African-American descent and why they are more palatable and, and, and I wish I could think of the term and when I get it, I'll send it to you all because it just sums it up so perfectly. And it's not an indictment of, of those people. It's just the reality of this is what's happening. And when you start looking at who's being promoted, we need that's another of the conversations that we need to have. When we start looking at who are the black people who are being promoted in the United States of America right now, how many of them are ADOS? People look at ADOS people, which is African um, um, Americans of Africa. What is it? American? What is it? African? I can't even think. ADOS. Um, Americans of. of slaves. Thank you. Because yeah, African descendants of slaves. Because it just went out of my head, right? And people look at them like they're like crazy, like they're just you know conjuring up trouble. But it really isn't, and it is a conversation that we do need to have. Right. Um, so go ahead. If I may go add to that, end. really quickly. No, 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 no. There are five hands raised, so we got to get to the people. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Right. I'm sorry. I didn't see yeah, that. I'm I walking. Close, I can see I it. Wanna, I just want to close out with. I just wanted Cleo to get your point on Joy Reid. That's all. All right. Okay. Thank you, Cheryl. Well, one one issue that I want to make clear too, because people are maybe none of you here, but people I've spoken to before are defensive. They have a certain affection for some of these people mm -hmm. and they see me as attacking them. And I have not attacked them. Mm -hmm. I haven't attacked them once. I'm, I'm, I'm exposing the system that puts them in the place. I mean, they may or may not. And I know some of the people who I've mentioned, they're not waking up in the morning going, let me be a good decoy for white supremacy this Thursday while I'm on TV. Being a decoy is not what, they, what they're intention to do. They just living in a society clueless. And, and, and get it a, getting a job to be with white in, in places where white people have been and thinking, oh, I made it because they were told you got to be twice as good as a white man. And clearly they were are twice as good as the white man. And they got they got these white approximates, approximities. So I don't necessarily believe that many of these people are going, I'm going to be a black white supremacist this Wednesday. They're just being ambitious Americans. And, and Donald Trump then already told you what America means. It means white. Let me say this, Cleo, before we, and I, and, and I don't know if Itabu Lang is still here. So when I was in South Africa, there's this concept that because I'm not an African, I'm a black person, but I'm not African, somehow while I'm in South Africa, I can be a quote unquote honorary white person. So <laughs> what I say, and you know, I stood, I said in a public forum, like I'm insulted. I don't even want to be honorarily white. I'm very comfortable with who I am as a black person. And how could you expect me to come into a black country and, and allow you to dis, um, separate me from my own people who look like me? Like, really? Like, no, we're not going to do that. So what I say to our, our brothers and sisters from other, you know, other countries who are here, maybe nobody's saying that you can be an honorary white person. But some of us are stepping into that role and knowing full well that you're stepping into that role and you're embracing it. And then you're showing up to speak for and redefine what it means to be Black in America. And that's very problematic. And that's a whole nother conversation. Um, so I'm turning it back over to you, Cleo. Sorry. It's a, no, it's a whole nother conversation. And I see the hands and I want to get some, get some of them. But I want, to, I want to push back a little bit to what you just said, Helen. What you, what you just said. Okay. Um, presumed, because you said they know what they're doing, um, is that there's a lot of intentionality. And mm -hmm. I don't agree that a lot of it's intentional in terms of the crevices of their dysfunction. Some of it is being on white supremacy accommodation is automatic pilot. They're not waking up in the morning and, and saying, I'm gonna do something that's crazy. Their parents or somebody taught them maybe twice as good as the, like, like. okay, you see, you you wrote in caps, so you really believe that. Some of them actually know. Okay, well, but what I'm gonna ask you to do as brief as you can, because I wanna talk to Pierre about slavery, if I can. Well, how do you know that they actually know? Okay, so if it's true, and if anybody, Pierre and, and, and some of my immig Im, um, immigrant friends who are on this call, please speak up. 
if there's any truth to the fact that we hear all the time that about when, immigrants now or African Americans? African, I'm no, no, no. I'm talking to our our brothers and sisters from uh, uh who black black uh, black immigrants here in the United States. Oh, okay. Um, or people who who have their answers. See, I'm, I'm answers. sorry. Wait, wait, wait. I don't want to be confused. Wait a minute. So when you said what you said about them knowing what they're doing, you're talking about immigrants. I'm talking about black. Um, and I hate you. People say don't use the word foreigner, so I'm trying to find another word. You're talking about immigrants, sense. right? Black. People. Okay, well that's different. That's different. Okay, uh, but I'm let me sorry. let me let me let me say this. Okay, so clearly what? So the reason I say that people know if there's any truth to the fact that when people are, are when you when you get here, you're told to stay away from Black Americans or or to distinguish yourself from Black Americans. That's how you know, and that's that's when. So when you're showing up in these spaces. You know, good. And I have a Ghanaian friend, and he was like, "Look, I tell, I tell my Ghanaian friends all the time. They don't like you any more than they like um, black Americans. But America has a vested interest, in which we need to understand, and in 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 supporting what they've done to black Americans. So anybody that they can help to be successful here or to help hold us down, they're going to use them. And as black people, we need to be conscious of what's happening." and not allow it to happen. And at what point do we, are we complicit in our own oppression when we act like we don't know that this is happening? So that that's one of our hot topics. Well, I want to respond to that, but my, Michael, Heard go ahead, go ahead. Asked, Michael Heard just asked, would, would, in all caps, would clear frustration. Are we still talking about entertainers? Um, and no, we weren't. Just now we were not talking about entertainers. But if you believe that entertainers are not a profoundly impactful part of the Black American psyche, you're, you're fooling yourself. Black people are the biggest te television watchers disproportionately, and even the moviegoers disproportionately in the United States than any other group. We try to escape through TV, through all kinds of stuff, because our realities are difficult. And white people understand that. That's why they put the CIA as our savior in Black Panther. And I don't got time to get into all of that, but watch it. One of our white saviors in Black Panther, which, which everybody loved, is from the CIA. And that's politically problematic given what the CIA has done to Martin, Malcolm, Fannie Lou, and all kinds of people. And, and I can't get into that right now, but I'm just pay, planting a seed regarding how, how the media impacts us and why he, to get that beautiful p p film made, he had to put the CIA in it. Because white people said, no, we're not going to have y'all just loving y'all. So we don't have to, we got to be in there in some kind of relevant way that's politically problematic. And they did. It's called the CIA. So put that in my, as my dad used to say, put that in your pipe and smoke it, and we'll get back to that. But, I, but what I want to say to Helen is that I'm talking about Black Panther, the Wakanda, because somebody is, is mad about us talking about entertainers and entertainers in, in um, Beyonce and his husband, whatever his name is. Um, et cetera. These people have a huge impact on Crazy. black people. On, on, yeah, all, so, so let's not fool ourselves into thinking that entertainers are irrelevant. They're, they're, they're chosen. They're purposely made into spokespersons because they're compromisable to send us into confusion. And they're very, very relevant. But getting back to Helen, I didn't know she was talking about immigrants when she said some of them know what they're doing. I thought she was talking about black people period. Now, let me address that real quickly. Whew. And I'm somebody who goes to Africa before COVID all the time. West Africa, Central Africa, Azania, which most of us know as South Africa, even Morocco. I go there all the time. And I've been in a situation before when, when Helen was in with somebody said, you know, you're basically white because you came from, from the United States. And I, and I was not offended because I get it. Now, let me be clear. I didn't get it silently. The conversation was getting ready to happen and the conversation did happen, but I get it. I know why people do say what they say. So instead of getting mad at them, I address the issue. I uh, take a lot of Ubers and half the time it's Africans who are driving us Ubers. And, and in Florida, it's often Haitians. Well, we'd be having some conversations, some black, some, some black mental health developing conversations and getting them to unass whiteness. I mean, that's what I do. But have you ever, Helen, have you ever seen Christians in Africa? Uh, are you, that's funny. Is that a joke? 
Christianity okay. is all over. All, went, look, yeah, yeah. Look, way too Africans, much. Africans can out Christian African Americans. Oh my God. It's I said if you so, can't, if you want, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. So the all point over. is the point is, Helen, mm -hmm. is that we're poisoned. And the white supremacy imposition and invasion is central to all of it. So that's why I don't get offended when I hear crazy stuff from somebody African or crazy stuff from somebody African. I get it. Y'all, you know, y'all been contaminated. And I mean, they give drama in Africa with the white Jesus that we only can fantasize about because Christianity with the white Jesus and the white God is one of the most successful weapons of mass destruction that was that has been dropped on, on people of African descent. Mm -hmm. So that's part of what's going on, Helen. And when you say that there's Black people who know what they're doing, but whether they know what they're doing or not, they're still inside of an unresolved colonial invasion of their, mm -hmm. of their experience. For example, I talk to young Africans all the time, and I ask young Africans to make them laugh but to get them to think. And I say, why do all of your judges and lawyers look like RuPaul? And they go, what? <laughs> and they make the face, same kind of face Helen is making. And I'm like, they all have on blonde wigs, white wigs. Yeah, I do. Still your, your judges and your attorneys. Mm -hmm. Now, instead of me going to all of that, I'll just say to this, Helen, they had never even thought about it. They had never even analyzed it. They had never even critically, until I came along, mm -hmm. Looked at, they just said that they, this is what you do when you, you go to you go to law school and you get a, a part of your graduation, you get a certificate and you get a wig that, that, that came from England. They don't they they're not they're not trained to deconstruct Christianity or white supremacy. Right. When I went to the dungeons in in um, Ghana, mm -hmm. there was a young man who lived right next door to the enslavement that is who didn't even know what they were. Mm -hmm. He didn't yeah. even know what they were. He lived right next door. Exactly. And so remember, the college is right next door. What's the university? Cape Coast University or whatever? Yeah. It's right next door to, yeah. yeah. They don't, yeah, it's really bad. The other thing too, is they don't teach anything about slavery, um, about, you know, so black people in America, like we're caught in the, in the hard, between a rock and a hard place because America is teaching you some BS about slavery and what it really meant. And then Africa, they're not teaching it at all. And you're like, so now, so now when you come to the United States and there's this, this What's sense, wrong with of, you? This sense of camaraderie, right? And you're like, you want to, and when I'm in Africa and I'm, I see these, these uh, uh, Christian churches on every corner and some with white people preaching in the pulpit, I'm like, do y'all even understand that this, you know, this is how we got where we are, but no, they don't because they're Can not I talking about it. And the other thing that's interesting too, when I was in Ghana, the, talking about not understanding what's been done to their minds, they only wear their African clothes on dress down Friday. And I don't like, they wear Western clothes Monday through Thursday. And I asked them like, I wore African stuff every day just for the hell of it because I was trying to make a, com a, 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 a comment, right? But do you even understand what you're saying? That when we, and I, they said, when we have to do business, we want to look professional. I said, so do you think the men in, in, in um, um, the Middle East, do they take off their clothes or, you know, or they, they, they do business and they do business. And, but it was just the whole mindset that they couldn't even grasp the fact that what you're saying is that what we do is not good enough. And when we want to be professional and we want to be respected, then we have to look like Western um, people like America. And that, and that's horrible. When I was in so Kenya. That's part of the, so that's part of the equation, Helen, <laughs> when they be doing this stuff that you look simply as intentional well, they know what they're doing. Not all of they're, them. Not all of them. Some of them, they don't even have the they're, they're brainwashed. Well, mm -hmm. I used to wear nothing but African clothes until many of them were stolen during, a, during a, a flight. And the day that I didn't have access to my clothing, I wore a t-shirt and jeans. Oh, this is this United States. A brother across the street said, you finally dressed like a human. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. That's what he said to me. So how are we going to, if we can, move from paralysis to practice regarding Black affirming behavior mm -hmm. and norms while we're in a trance. 
Well, same with hair. my afro. I had a woman in Philly, a black American woman in Philly. She said, your hair is so pretty. You're so brave to wear it. I'm like, brave? <laughs> but that's the psyche that we're, yeah. So we got a lot of unconditioning to do. So, yeah. You have some hands and I want to get through Pierre, yes. but, I, but I want to get some of these hands. I'm trying to be brief, y'all, because we, we are going to end in this Yeah, way. we are. We are really over time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I know something? that Abu, um, I can't Abu say Bakar. Abu Bakar. Abu Bakar, please. Your hand has been up for a very long time. Go ahead. Yes. Yes, but you know what? I, I love this discussion because uh, I'm an immigrant from uh, the Ivory Coast originally. Thank you, uh, Professor Carter, to invite uh, me. But I think you, the same way we need to understand African American because mm -hmm. unless we, like I said it, unless we understand the post slavery syndrome uh, that uh, you, you guys suffer, we won't be able to start back in back our self-love and it's, it's, it is true. So it's the same thing that we need to be educated yes. both ways. We're lacking of ed education. And that's sad because uh, I don't blame, when I see an, uh, a, a, a young African-American under drug, I don't blame him because this is coming from somewhere. I don't say that he's lazy like some people on my part can say, and uh, we from Africa, when you come to America, they're gonna say, okay, you need to be careful. If there's gang, don't go there, uh, do your work. But we need to understand where this is coming from. So I have another mindset and I, I say that I'm here for a purpose. Sure. Well, thank I'm you, brother. Here. One, one, and we definitely want... have to have you back when we have our conversation. Yes. And, and Cleo, maybe we need you to help us guide that conversation, specifically talking about the Black American, the Americans and Black folks in America, whether you're descendants or whatever, whatever. So thank you. Um, Abu... I want Abu to say to Mr. K Mr. Koyete, I want to say Koyate. to him, yeah. Mr. Koyate. <laughs> I envy you, you Africans, with your own names that are thousands of years old. While we hollering, while we're hollering, Aisha Johnson. But anyway, we have we have our part to do. That's why we're here. We need to help you recover sure, but, your but, name. But I, ex exactly, I agree. That's why I said that because you know mm -hmm. I agree. But I want to I want to give you something to tell your country women and men to consider when they when you ever ever hear that African Americans are lazy. Remind them that Africans built this country for almost 200 years for free, with no money, for free. That's, that, that's a huge contradiction to lazy. Yeah. So that's just, you know, just, just give you some tools to for them to think about, because they might not even know about that fact. And there's but a reason, <laughs> there's a reason that we are expected, they want everybody to, look, that's why they hated Barack Obama. Because Barack Obama defied for the whole world to see every myth that they had propagated about Black people. He was married. He had, uh, you know, he was educated. All these things that were not supposed to be true. And a beautiful the, Black wife, not a mixed yes, wife and not exactly. a white wife. And they were like, we cannot have this because we have spent a lot of time and energy in making Black people think that, one, they're not enough or good enough. And we sold a whole bill of goods around the world about Black Americans that we must not let this man, um, you know, weaken. So yeah, but that. So and yeah, this we, is why Trump, who you can tell for all the way from the Ivory Coast, uh, with or without glasses, is an idiot. Trump is an idiot, but he was perfect because he was perfectly white focused. He was going to make America great again, and he was going to make up for eight years of Michelle and Barack Obama and defying the, the myth of white supremacy in our face. They said, we have to reverse this. We, no matter, by all means, that's to say, we don't want no liberal. We want a crazy white in your face person to be the president. And that's how Trump got there. True. Thank you, brother, for, 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 for coming on. I hope to talk to you more later. Please come back. I love having you. Don't leave us. I will. Uh, who, was, who was next? Myra, I think your hand's been up for a very long time. Myra, be brief. Myra, are you still with us? Yes, I'm still. Okay. And I'll be brief. Honestly, I've forgotten my question. <laughs> Except that um, since, you know, I have to go and I was waiting to get to this, how we, we you know, like a, a clear, concise, concise, how do we do this in terms okay. of, you know. So hold tight. 
I'm okay. going to get that. I, I, I want to answer some of that right now. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Myra, mm -hmm. we need to use our minds and bodies and, and, and capacity to communicate and care to be a critical thinking source and, and asset to other Black people. We need to use ourselves to be a critical critical thinking source and asset to other black people. We have to engage in ways that defy anti-blackness. We, ha we have to not, we have to stop calling black people in words. We have to stop calling black people black this or black that. We have to stop racializing each other and talk about what black men do and what black women do, which is often stuff everybody does where we racialize ourselves because we tr we're trained to be anti-Black. We have to look at our language. We have to stop saying stuff like Black on Black crime. Black on Black crime is a hypnotic mind F, which is F-U-C-K, I don't like to use that word, that keeps us in the trance because there's no such thing as a term white on white crime, though white on white crime matches in frequency what's called black on black crime. But be, to protect whiteness, they don't have that stigmatizing word. My point to you is that we have to think about language we and we have to be actively critical of all systems of communication, TV, movies. That's why I mentioned the CIA in Wakanda. We can't sit through Black Panther and enjoy it and not have problems with the CIA being the saviors to help black people kill black people. This is, which is what he did in, in that movie. We have to also face that we live in a society that's not neutral. Mm -hmm. For example, you cannot find on most TV stations, rather, or movies or theaters, a black on black love story. The only equivalent is something, for example, like the show Power. Remember the show Power? Anybody remember the show Power? Power yeah. featured a black man who's really a, 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 a glorified drug dealer who didn't even touch his black wife, who was running after a white woman or Latina white woman throughout the whole series. We have to know when it's time to be offended. That's why I brought up the brother from South from Azania, South Africa, about the word kafir. They know, oh, I'm not calling myself that. That's, that's, that's an offense. We have to become teachers in every space we are with other black people. And we have to get out of the judge, the judging and mean spiritness that has caked on us over generations of unresolved black trauma. Like I said before, instead of saying black people ain't shit, when we see the residual impact of white supremacy mythology, which is what happened on CNN, which is what happened on MSNBC, which is why Kamala was that choice. We have to say and recognize that it's white supremacy mythology that ain't shit. And we have to, we have to I'm, 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 I know you got to speak, I want to say this one, this one thing, because I, I can go on and on in terms of the hows. We have to unlearn internalized white accommodationist behavior and white supremacy mythology, which is a lifelong, well, it don't have to be a lifelong. It could be a month long if you go to one of my classes. But to be able to decode white supremacy at all times is another strategy and behavior that we have to take on as a norm. And the final thing I'll say in this particular tangent, because you want to speak, is that we have to stop finding new reasons to re-traumatize Black people. OK, I, would, I just have one more little part, part I want to ask you. While we're packing Black self-love, where do, if anywhere, do white people fit into our lives? Are we supposed to hate them? Are we supposed to run away from them, stay away from them, believe they're, they're evil and so they can't be a part of our lives? How do, how do they fit in, if at all? Ooh. Okay. That's a hard question. No, it's not hard at all. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not hard at all. It's mm -hmm. just deep that we um, can be concerned about them and what to do with them. <laughs> um, that, that's, that's, it's not difficult at all. Um, 
I have to use my life to answer that question because I don't have time to talk about it academically or didactically like I can. But I'm black all day long, 24 seven. Um, I run multi a multi-million dollar nonprofit organization. I am financially solvent. My, my uh, FICO score is 839, I'm sorry, 829. Mine is uh, okay, well, it's, well <laughs> anyway, <I'm on. laughs> I just had to say that. <laughs> anyway, my point is I'm doing well and white folks ain't got nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. I rarely see white folks. And when I do see white folks, it's on my terms because they fixing my cable or, mm -hmm. or something like that. My point is that I would never advise people what to do with or without white folks. My point is that our focus needs to be a comp compensatory response to rebuilding Black folks. Mm. Okay, I can that needs to, that. White, pe white people and what they're doing and what they think and what they might say, and what happens in their life, don't even cross my mind. It's a, completely irrelevant to me. However, I will answer one question. I'm not telling mm -hmm. anybody to hate nobody. But mm -hmm. what I am telling you to do is love Black people. Mm -hmm. I am saying that and love yourself as a black person and unlearn internalized white supremacy mythology. I am saying that, but mm -hmm. because I, there's, not a, there's not a hateful bone in my body. There's a, there's a defensive bone in my body. I'm defensive in response to people that are attacking blackness and black people. And I re react to that in a way that deflects or challenges or stops it. But what white people think and do, and oh, they might think this or, it mm -hmm. don't even cross my mind. What crosses my mind is what's going to happen to Black people? What state are Black people in? How is this going to harm Black people? That's why I talked to those mental health professionals at, a, at those mental health conferences about when Dylan Roof murdered those people in that church, did they talk to their children? That's why when, that, when these Black mothers and sometimes fathers call me and say, my child was just called a name, what do I do? I ask them, who, they, who are they protecting? Because they have not said anything to their child themselves, and they call in me. <laughs> and what they and and they always say, I don't give a dang. They're from Kentucky, Baltimore. I don't want them to be angry. And then I ask them again, angry at who? And they go into a catatonic state temporarily because they had never thought about that. Who they're prioritizing over giving their child guidance on a reality that they can't help but to have to run into in their lifetime, which is the white supremacy mythology. They're gonna run into it. So the best thing to do is teach them that white supremacy mythology, whether it's television, whether it's Snow White and Seven Doors, whether it's a lack of love stories for them to watch as children on television, this is all the result of something else outside of them being corrupt that's typically in white hands. It's not that they're, it's not that they're wrong. Mm -hmm. And when they're not told the truth, they're here, act as, act, be twice as good as a white man, N-word, sit your black ass down, all that kind of stuff. That's that's re-traumatizing their psyche, re-implying that they're that they're deficient, and re-implying that the reason things are as they are in this system is because we're black and they're white, and this is our destiny. And I think we and have then to... you have the church with the white Jesus and the white God all over the place that reinforces the mythology of black inferiority, black normalized down, downtroddenness, and white wonderfulness. Mm. Well, and they're really uh, pushing that and black men and black women I'm going to close with this because I see a hell in it I was going to speak but I'm going to tell you right now this is very dangerous white people are really opportunizing off that black confusion and the lack of black love stories and are literally encouraging with some level of success black people not to look at other black people as, as life partner options mm. well uh, yeah, wait no 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 My, Myra no we really got to get to the other there's like four other people there's and we four are we are out of time, big time. Um, okay, and, 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 that, and, and that's another conversation that we also need to have, Cleo, not right now, but what is happening? Because every commercial, every print ad, all of this stuff is showing mixed couples um, or biracial, so something's and that's and that's not by accident. So it's we not. do, that is something that we need to talk about. So let me see, a hand, Denisha, we have not heard from you. Denisha, go ahead real quick, please. Thank you. Um, and first of all, just thank you for this platform. Um, I am very um, purposefully trying to decolonize um, my mind, body, and soul. 
And this conversation has really affected me like on an emotional level. And mm -hmm. so to, um, to the question that Myra had also how, I want to know who do I follow? Who do I read? Um, because it's a trance um, that I will say, I know that I'm in and I am on autopilot. How do you get to that place where you're not just re-traumatizing not only other Black people, but yourself on a daily, and I apologize, mm -hmm. this is just really right. um, okay. Okay. affecting me uh, because I don't want to continue at this stage of my life to be in this trance. So I just need to know where do, what resources do I go to to um, aid me in decolonizing um, myself? question. I just want to um, let you know I appreciate you, sister, and thank you for your emotional honesty. And I just want to honor you for being real in our presence in your tears. Thank you for being real. Thank you. You're very welcome, sister. Um, the people to pay attention to who are talking about these issues in no nonsense direct ways are myself. Um, I do workshops, I do live stream discussions, and I'm developing an institute called the, the Black Critical Thinking and Culture Affirmation Institute that is going to be teaching Black people this information. We also have a project called Black Leadership Through Parenting, where we teach Black parents how to be intentional parents to Black children and teach them how to guide their children toward being able to decode the white supremacist corruption, which is all over the place, that they will drown in if they don't get a black affirming safety net. So um, I'm I'm a source, and and, and I and I and I'm a pretty decent source when I'm in the context of educating. Read the works of Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. Um, she I have to say that I don't like saying stuff like this, but I got to say this in case because I'm not going to be around when you read the book. Um, as I said before, she was one of the most premier brilliant deconstructionist of white supremacy mythology and its impact on black people that I, that's ever been born. And she has some issues too around patriarchy that she never resolved. I think that I think that patriarch toxic patriarchy is a problem. Um, white supremacy mythology rolls out through a patriarchal lens. So there so there's a lot of patriarchal harm that's done through white supremacy that she doesn't address enough for me. But um, other than that, when it comes to the science of white supremacy deconstruction, you, you can't get no better than Dr. Welsing. She also um, has an, uh, on YouTube, there's, a, there's an interview between her and this guy named Shockley on Tony Brown's journal, where she is called in to debate Tony Brown, excuse me, to debate Shockley, who's a, who's a racist who used a um, skeleton to to um, measure the size of the black cranial cavity to to imply that black people were in fear and fear to watch her spank his ass like with a plum and flow. She ain't, she was no joke. So check out Dr. Welsing. There's also a book that's helpful. I apprehensive to rec to recommend it because it's so huge and it's very academic, but you might want to you know take up three or four years to read it you know while in the bathroom or while you're chilling or whatever, and it's called Urugu Why You Are You G U by Dr. Marimba Ani. Why you are you G U? Yes. yes, and it's a deconstruction. It's a um, it's a book that puts white folks and their behavior in context. Like she talks about something called the rhetorical ethic. And the rhetorical ethic is a tendency to come up with words that hide how horrible something really is. Like they call the murder of people manifest destiny. Um, they use terms like friendly fire when it's really somebody who was murdered inside of the group. And they have all these words that um, cloak 
how evil something is mm -hmm. even when when um mm -hmm. what's that white boy's name on cnn anderson cooper anderson cooper did a recreation of the doll test where that the clarks developed in the late 30s and again this was during obama's administration most of the black children cho chose the white doll and they called it white biased they call it a as, as opposed to internalized white supremacy and how destructive it really is mm -hmm. and and they and they didn't deconstruct that having a white bias is horrific and horrible they called it just a simple white bias so she deconstructs what how they behave to get us a look at how they influence our behavior so those are the only three that i could think of some people have brought up some other things that i that i think are more metaphor mm -hmm. like somebody brought up the, in the bottom of the well which is a story about um it's stories. It's not really based on real real things. Like aliens are coming to get the melanin from white folks, excuse me, from black folks, and white folks had an opportunity to send black people to the moon, and and, and this is what they did. It's, it's, it's stuff like that. Um, somebody mentioned something else that was important a moment ago. I want to find it and reiterate it. Um, um, because I think what the audience brings is very important. Oh yeah. Um. Another thing to be mindful of in terms of white people doing what they do is the pushback of crit on critical theory, critical race theory. Mm -hmm. um, they're pushing LGBTQ, which is a white a white agenda. Those homosexuals, the same gender loving people weren't created by white folks, but LGBT was. They're pushing LGBT in the schools, but they won't do critical race theory in the schools because one is white, one affirms whiteness, and one deconstructs the, the material that puts us in a trance that might make us wake up and they don't want that to be a normal part of what's happening in schools. So my point in all this, Donisha, is that we have to walk around this planet with a critical analysis. We have to stop pretending it's neutral and stop letting our feelings be hurt that it's neutral because oh white people don't like us that needs to not matter to us anymore whether they like us or not what needs to matter is, to us more than anything is do we love ourselves or not as black people and like helen said earlier in response to the question some question that somebody said she said no the question is have you internalized white supremacy and my final thing is don't fall for the okie doke <laughs> and what i mean by that <laughs> And this gets people upset, but I'm going to say it. Black Lives Matters had us feel like, oh my God, there's somebody who's on our side. And, and now our issue was getting some media attention, but built inside of the mantra Black Lives Matters is a white accommodationist instruction. White folks, please let us matter. Please let us matter, white people. That's insane. Is that Linda? Can somebody mute Linda, please? That's insane that we have to ask anybody, can we matter? We just need to stand up and matter to each other. And when we stand up and matter to each other, it's over with. We're going to deal with resistance, but we're going to be so in solidarity with each other because we have the brilliance, we have the technology, we have the money, we have the capacity, if we came together collectively, to do what we did at Black Wall Street with another modern lens of defense. See, the mistake that our ancestors made in Black Wall Street is that they thought that white people would be impressed with them because they, they did really well and did stuff that white people do. They would be impressed and embrace them. And white folks said, wait a minute. This is what, and this is what happened with why Trump became president. They said, wait a minute, we need proof of our superiority. We can't be having this stuff, black people with airports, because they had airports, they had a, they had an airport in, in black world. Black people with banks, black people with commerce, black people with real estate. But we, no, no, we got to we got to we got to burn this down because we need the myth of white supremacy mythology, like a crack addict needs crack. We need that myth to get up in the morning because we're fearful of being discovered as mediocre. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. So. It, 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 and I can't be the only spokesperson. You have to be a spokesperson. Everybody on this on this call needs to know what I know and talk about it without whispering in the presence of other Black people. Absolutely. 
Mm. Well, let's try and get to these last three questions. Thank you so much, Denisha. I think it's your first time with us. Please, please, please yes. come, come again. But I'll we be back. We don't Thank have you. Cleo every week, but we still have good conversations. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Uh, very quickly, um, Monyang, we haven't heard from you. Sheila, we haven't heard from you. Pierre, you'll be our final final person speaking tonight. So Moon, I think I'm saying your name right. Moon Yin? Yes, Moon Yin. yes okay. hi. Thanks hi. a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to give two observations. Um, one has to do with what we're taught very, very early. And sometimes it doesn't have to be uh, deep or long. And, uh, you know, uh, young people can't process a lot of information right away. But if you tell them they're from Queens, as my grandmother told us, from Queens and Kings, I remember that as a, as a very young child. The second thing is, but, well, both my parents were educators. I don't know if that had something to do with this, but I remember my mother said before I was even called a uh, nigger, she said, that means uh, niggardly means uh, uh, bad behavior. She says, so if somebody calls you that, call them white nigger and see what happens. So lo and behold, in the fourth grade, that happened. And I called this girl, she called me nigger. And I said, oh, you're a white nigger. And she was so, oh, she was just so upset <laughs> and just was beside herself and went off crying. And I, have, and I was so uh, empowered you know, because I knew that I wasn't a, a nigger anyway, but at, at the same time, I was able to stand my ground. And I think we need to tell children very early how they can respond without running away crying. And that might not be something that you would ascribe to, but I think it works. They are not gonna process, um, you know, all of this philosophy, but they, but they know what hurt feelings are and white kids at the same age know what hurt feelings are. So let them go running home to their parents, telling them uh, that they were called a nigger. Yeah, so uh, to me, that is very, is very important that we give some short answers for the hurt that our people are, are feeling and you know, sort of deflect if you wanna, if, if you understand what I mean. And uh, anyway, that works. I just wanted to share that that's what I tell my nieces and nephews, you know. So they're king, from kings and queens, and they're white niggas. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> so we yeah, have to so. not in, we have to not internalize that which has been told to us about us. And you know, oh, well, and, well that's and, yeah, that's that's and, true. But sometimes, yeah. you know, that's that's something that adults can understand. But children know you said but something, why, you threw but, a rock and but, hit me. But that's why we know. also have to take responsibility for teaching our children ourselves, at least I think, oh, yeah. K through six. K through six should be because that's when the mind is shaping. Now they eventually oh, have to go out into the real world, but by then they will go with a foundation, a strong foundation of who they are. And for those of us who can't, I don't have kids, right? But you know, finding a, a, a black a private school is not the easiest thing. But you know, as a community, we can come together. And we can have Saturday sessions where we're teaching our own kids in our own community how to believe in themselves and understand that you never have to apologize for being who you are. And being Black is not a sin. It's a beautiful thing. Everybody yeah. wants something of what we have. And the sooner we start to understand that, the better. So, and I find, I deal with white people all the time. I was homecoming queen at an all-white school. So I understand white people. I do. And I say that to say that I, I am not mesmerized by them. I grew up with them. I know that they're not smarter than me. I know that they're not all rich. I know that when I'm watching TV, it's a farce. So mm -hmm. on the, in the same token, when they're showing us as drug dealers and, and hookers and this and that, I know that's BS too. So we have got to step into who we are and be unapologetic about it, be proud and recognize that when I embrace me, it's not to the exclusion of you. I want you to celebrate who you are too, whatever you are, but I am going to celebrate me and I don't need your permission. I'm not going to be apologetic about it. And if it makes you uncomfortable, then that's something that you have to deal with because I'm good. And on that note, I'm preaching. Um, so uh, well, I want to respond too, if I, if I can, ahead, and, and I may be shorter than you. 
Ooh. Anyway, <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Okay. Um, uh, Miss, um, your name is covered up. Say your name right. Moonyin. Uh, Moon, Moonyin. Miss Moonyin, I agree with the letting our children know that we came from kings and queens and being very specific about who they are and, and having the tools to show them because children are very visual who these kings and queens are and their relevance. And I think that's a good thing. Uh, I don't agree with the the, the nigga thing because um, hmm. I am, I imagine that when some white people, when a white person first hears that, they probably be shocking or whatever, but the word nigger, like the word peck of wood and cracker, et cetera, really don't mean nothing to them because they weren't being hung while those words were being used on them. They don't, it's not embedded in their psyche to be that, that upset about it for too long. Um, and I don't care what they say and what they, what they do. But what, what one thing I want to push back on a little bit, and this is based on experience, not just theory, the, the, we have, we have we, along with the class that we have called Black Leadership Through Parenting, we have a project called Watu Wajua. Watu Wajua means children of the sun in Swahili. And it's a course built around teaching critical thinking and decoding skills to children, babies, as early as five and four years old. And one of the things that we do in the Watu Wajua project is we ask the children to bring some books or some magazines or some anything, a doll or whatever they have that they really love and they, and they really like that they, that they find value in. And in more cases than one, the kids, some of these kids bring a white doll. Um, they bring magazines and stuff that, that, that they're not even in. Now, there's exceptions to this. Some kids do bring black dolls. And there's some kids who know, who, whose parents were talented and taught them to love their image. But unfortunately, at least half the class um, brings things in that is irrelevant to them, like a purple dinosaur or something, or that doesn't affirm them. And the children are asked straight up, does any of this make you feel good about being what you are? And these are five-year-olds. And um, they, that question is like strange to them because they never thought about it. And when they get Teen, teen Beat Magazine, whatever that back magazine is called, and it's full of sexy white kids and they're not in it, they hadn't thought about that before. It was just material. And their parents are bring it to their attention. Once you bring to a black child's attention that they're valuable, that they're beautiful, that this is a problem, not you who have the problem, but this system has a problem, and 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 you're worthy of love and all the, the earth, all the good things that are worth the, the world has to offer. But you're missing from here because somebody else has a problem, not you. They can get that. But Cleo, my, my question to you, brother, is this. Sometimes children, and, and we can get around the fact that sometimes you want to hit somebody, okay? So maybe you can't physically do that, or maybe you can, but anyway, I'm not going to. But, but the thing is, all the things that you're saying, that's fine and good. But I'm saying you should also arm these kids somehow. You may not like the term but you have to give them some kind of power that they can fight back at that early age. You know, it has nothing to do with whether or not they love themselves. It's somebody calling them a name or throwing a rock and hitting them. And so, well, you, again, yeah, I, I won't belabor it, but like I just I said, believe- Like I said, you know, I agree with the first part of what you said. If somebody says some stuff, and I've literally taught kids that. If somebody okay. says some something about them being an N-word and go, wait a minute, you don't get it. I came from kings and queens. Our people taught your people how to use cologne. Our people taught your people about sewer systems. Now you think so, a fourth, fourth grader is going to do that? Yeah, I've seen them do that. Yeah. Okay. They, they uh, didn't know okay. it. They, yeah. they okay, didn't know everybody, it. it's, it's almost eight o'clock. We started at five. And we mm -hmm. still have two people we need to hear yeah. from, Sheila and Pierre. And Thank Sheila you, is first. And then okay, Pierre. I'll talk to you another time. This is, the conversation continues, clearly. And Helen and Dr. Cleo, they are planning to have another conversation because it goes on. Next, please. Please. <laughs> for God's sake, please. 
Well, you should give, you know, you should have a time limit for everybody, I guess. From, and everybody, from now on. Sheila and, <laughs> right. And you're right, my sister, Sheila and Pierre, please, can you keep it down to two minutes so we can get off of here with closing remarks by eight o'clock? Yes, yeah, so I'm going to try my very best. Just thank you um, for inviting me to Dr. Linda Carter. Um, I'm an educator, I'm a lifelong educator, and I just want to add a few things. Uh, somebody wrote earlier that, um, you know, we should stop the kids from listening to Kanye West and Jay-Z. And I just wanted to just say something um, to that, that I don't know if people are actually listening to Kanye and what he's talking about, other than the snippets that we allow a media that we don't control to um, put forth in front of our children and in front of us as a people, but yet and still they promoted um, supporting Kamala when it, it, and it's not personal of course I don't know her personally but the whole chucks and pearls and it just represented symbolism when we had Kanye running if you listen to his platform he was running on everything that we really needed in the times of now but now nobody's talking about reparations um, even though we saved this democratic election um, as a people nobody's talking about canceling student um, loan um, student debt and uh, and, and we're not even talking about the George Floyd, Floyd bill. We're not talking about anything that we're getting out of the deal. And these are things that people like um, Kanye West and Ice Cube were promoting and people were calling them coons on um, a wide mass level. And these are some things that we need and we didn't get anything. But what was received was an Asian bill. Um, what was received was the $45 billion that was set aside from the last administration for our HBCUs. Um, it has been struck down by Biden for two um, to three billion. And all I want to say is that if we, if, as we go on, I would love to hear more conversation about how we can stop being so loyal to one party who's just has not given us back in return, um, you know, reciprocated what we've given to them. I think that's really important to explore and how that there, um, dissent, there's dissension within the ranks of the Democratic Party itself as it relates to us and just open up a more critical thinking discussion on that because right, we really wanna see what both parties have to offer us. I don't think either party um, cares anything about us as a race but we have to see like when when we're trading one person in and and i've always voted democrat but it, when we're trading one person in that was given us a five 45 billion dollars for our um hbcus for another person who's given two we can't explain that and it's something that we have to place accountability on as opposed to just blindly continuing what we've been doing for years just voting you know democratically and again thank you guys um you know for the outlet to share that this evening i appreciate each and every one of you thank you uh, i agree with you i agree with you completely sister yeah. completely yeah we're in a we're in a hard place i mean like here in new jersey sheila's in new jersey um you know voting in this last election was really difficult and you know in talk, terms of politics which is a whole nother conversation i think that the democratic party takes us for granted, um, no matter how you slice it. And what they should have learned in last week's election is that you can keep um, um, trying to um, court other, other um, constituencies, be it the gay community, be it the Latino community, but you cannot win an election unless Black people show up. And the sooner they understand that, and we understand that the better, but that's a whole hey, but that's a That's a whole other conversation. Mm -hmm. And something that Robin just said, Mm -hmm. um, it's significant. She said, we don't show up to negotiate. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that showing up to negotiate requires is that you really respect yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, during Obama's administration, Latina, Latin, Latinx immigrants and white gays got hooked up. But they got hooked up not simply because Obama went around finding them to hook up. They were in his face. Mm -hmm. We were too busy celebrating that Gladys Knight sung last night. And, and we love Michelle Obama's dress mm -hmm. because we settle for less because we think we are less. So we can't show up and we're not less, that's a lie. But we can't show up and make Obama or anybody else accountable if we, don't, if we think we're just N-words. 
and it, we're in a trauma trance. I mean, all, everything that we need to do that's in the palm of our hands cannot be done while we're in a trance. We got to come out of the. We got to come out the trance. And we need to stop expecting that people know what we want, right? So, and there was a whole lot of protectionism also going on around the Barack Obama thing that did not serve us well. Did not serve us well at all. So I look forward to the conversation when we dissect the efficacy of the Obama administration and do we want to uh, another Obama administration? Pierre, you are- Yeah, but we have, a half, we have a half Obama, we have Obama love, but that's yeah. a whole nother- uh, Well, I mean, and, and that's my thing. I think that she is a continuation of Obama because the perception is, is that that's what we want. Like, yeah, we, we had Obama, Obama was the first black, we get that, but- Biracial. Okay. Yeah, I know that. But okay. <laughs> okay. See, he is. I'm, I'm not making it up. He has. He's. He was half black. Yes, he is. But the and whole not thing, and not and not African American. Yes, all of that, all of that. But he showed up as a black person, and we embraced him. As, and one thing I have to say, I have to give him credit that I won't give some other folks that I won't call by names. He is very clear. He doesn't say I'm biracial. He says I'm a black man. So I'm gonna give him that. And I think that we have to be real careful on deciding who is and who isn't. Now, once you claim you put yourself out there is that we have a responsibility to make sure that you show up as that and make sure that you understand what that means. And that's where Barack Obama maybe be a little fuzzy about what it really means. But anyway, Pierre- We'll, we'll debate someone. about that later. Yes, somebody I can't said, wait, I can't I, wait. Somebody said, I want to hear from Pierre, but, I, but somebody just said, um, and we don't, we're not gonna get into it, but somebody just said, and, how was LGBT plus a white platform? Trans black people are the most likely to be persecuted. Um, I'm not going to go there except to say that that's not true. The most likely to be persecuted in this country is a black male. Statistically, that's a fact. Mm -hmm. that during last count, about 28 black trans were killed. Almost 2,000 Black women were killed, and almost 10,000 Black men were killed. So that's not true. Now, unfortunately, when it comes to crisis and drama, Black people are disproportionately impacted more than anybody. Most of the trans were impacted by abuse of Black. Most of the men who are, who are um, inheritors of abusive situations are Black. Most of the women who, with HIV, for example, in the United States are Black. So yes, but um lgbtq is a white platform and the reason we're talking about trans issues is because white gays decided that that would be the united states conversation that's a fact now let's let's get to pierre are you guys ready for me all right ah, i don't know i don't know if i'm ready for you but it's your turn to talk <laughs> <laughs> right. So yeah, I was just um just commenting on just the the attitude I believe people of of color you know have to have to have you know we need to be unapologetically ambitious. We need to. That's right. You Can you know, speak up, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I was saying we need to be unapologetically ambitious. Um, I, I absolutely look at everything that that's happened. I read a lot of history books and and try to get into it and try to understand why things happened. And what I really came away with it is, yes, all these things happened, but we definitely didn't hold ourselves accountable for it. As, as, as a people, we, we looked for, oh, you know. Can you be specific? Can you be specific? Um, Can you be real specific? One, okay, um, one of the, the, the things that's super specific is, is credit. It, it's, it, <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't get it unless you owe money to you know, said company. But why are you even trying to achieve it when you don't need it? It's, it's based off of the money you actually earned. It, 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 it's, it's just little things like that where it's like we can look at it a completely different way and not the way that they're telling us to look at it. And instead of that, we keep on looking at it the way it's being like pushed down our throats. And, and what, what I've, 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 been, I've been addicted to the, to the year of 1966. Cause I feel like the same thing that was happening then is happening right now. Like it's weird. I, I really feel like I'm, I'm watching the world repeat itself right in front of my eyes and, and I'm not old. <laughs> so it's like, I'm, I'm not like, like you guys 50. Like I, I can only imagine. Wait, 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 Pierre. <laughs> yeah, wait, Pierre. I'm not old. I'm not 50, 60 like no, you guys. No, no, no. What I'm saying, like, I'm, not, like I'm, I'm, I'm still new to the world. Like I'm, 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 I'm not, you know, I don't have a whole bunch of experience to prove 
everything I'm saying. That's why I, I read up on these history things. And and like I said, 1966 and 2020, like 2020, 2021, it's like the same exact things are happening. Like the same, like that's like true. Thing. Like it's it's crazy. And 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 I really looked at it and I was just like, well, what were our leaders doing then? And and what our leaders were doing then, we're talking. To They're them. being assassinated. And and yes, and being killed. And so, yeah. like when, when when you said, you know, um, you know, oh, those those, those parents. They don't want their kids to be angry. It's like they don't want their kids to die. <laughs> like, like they, they still have it in their head. Like, I don't want my kid to die for just being himself. And, and, and instead of, you know, having that, like, I, like my generation isn't afraid of the things that they, they tried to make us or make people afraid of anymore. Like, we, we've proven we can make the money. We've proven we can be a president. We, like, we've proven all those things. Those aren't those aren't like huge accomplishments to us. To us, it's like, that's what's supposed to happen. So, Pierre, Pierre, yeah. excuse me for interrupting, but I have to because I hear what you're saying, but children um, are not completely stupid and adults have to deal with a heavy unconscious and a heavy conscious mind. And you said something interesting. You said that we should be more accountable. And then you talked about what was pushed down our throats. Well, if something's being pushed down your throat, it's difficult to be accountable to yourself because you're trained to be accountable to what's being pushed down your throat. That's what you're trained to care about, know about, and respond to. But right, but in order to and, 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 and you decision, also you, you have to do some research, and if you do any research, you'll realize well, people do research, but people research what they value, and really? if they don't value black people, they're not going to research black people. That's right. Oh no, I'm talking and about the black and, people. Like I know, I know who you talking. About. That, yeah. That's who I'm talking about too, man. That's who I, all I'm talking about. I'm talking about black people. I'm talking about black people. Black people are trained to look at each other with a lot, lot of judgment. In no context, but a lot of judgment, a lot of emotionality. I call us tick, tick, boom. We always, we always in tick, tick, boom, um, state because ready to go off because we have a lot of misdirected rage. But you said that we should be accountable, and I agree, we should be accountable. The, the sister a moment ago talked about how we don't hold the polit our officials accountable. True, 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 true. But what's not talked about with the same level of force is why we don't. And we keep on acting like we're making a bunch of decisions. And we live a life that's centered around the generational inheritance of white accommodationist behavior. That's what we're that's what we're conditioned to do at all costs. Even when we call ourselves N-words, we don't realize that when we call ourselves N-words, that's white accommodationist behavior. They came up with the term. Our people in Azania, because that's right, more than right. once, yep. they the people in the Zanya know about kafirs and they said, we ain't going out like that. Well, we um, are brainwashed. And the final thing I'll say, which is why we have a little work to do, is that we are a targeted group. We're not sitting here just being in, in a neutral society where things happen to ha happen to us. I talk, people might, might think it's trivia. Somebody got, got, somebody whined, excuse me, somebody complained about me talking about entertainment. Well, living in a society where a people like us watch TV so much and not seeing us loving each other and not seeing a black love story, that's powerfully problematic. So we're be, we have to admit that we're being brainwashed so we won't be accountable. We should be accountable and I am accountable and, and, and Helen created this platform. It's a powerful example of somebody being accountable. However, we need more people to do it. And I think it was you if I, who brought up slavery, wasn't it you? Yeah, I brought it up. Say what you said. Now, we don't really have to edit this or talk, you know, prepare to end on this one. You're getting oh, ready to provoke me. But say, <laughs> but, but say that again, because you, you, you said everything but that. What did a you say about of, slavery? Uh, so many people I talk to about these subjects, they, they refuse to acknowledge that a lot of us were sold into slavery by us. Okay. <laughs> see, see, see. Like they, now, they, they what do you know? Okay, who, 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 who did it? 
Name somebody. No, it, was, it was everybody who did it. No, it, was it wasn't. Business. That's it not was true. Business. That's not true. I'm asking you to be specific because I can be specific. I want you to be specific. So the the people who were were stealing the people Benin. who so like my, my family's from from Haiti and Benin. So the people right. who were stealing in Benin that were caught stealing and everything, they were sold into slavery. They they were people that were part of the community, but they were sold into slavery. Okay, how, so so, so, so that, what, that you're, what you're what you're saying, what you're implying, is that black folks saw white folks coming and just up and sold black people to an outside an outside group. No, no, not at all. It was a business. It didn't start business. that way. Okay, we don't have time to get into this. We but sure I, don't. That's what I'm gonna just say. I'm just, we, go ahead. I'm just gonna say this. You need to learn to have to talk about that conversation, Pierre, with some specifics. I thought I what, 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 because I can do it. We don't got time. Get <laughs> well, get them fine. I, I know them already, so I don't gotta get them. I know them. I know about. King Joseph and the, and the and the whole thing and who the primary monarchs there was only two of them, the primary monarchs who got seduced into buying into enslavement. I also know about Queen Nzinga. Do you know about Queen Nzinga? Mm -hmm. I, I, what, I can tell you, I read a lot, bro. What do you know about Queen Nzinga? <laughs> same thing. They they all did the same thing. No, they did. They all no, turned they their did. back on 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 their people. It, that that's not true. Cool. That's not see. That's not true, brother. Queen Nzinga fought against the Portuguese and saved her people from slavery. And there were all kinds of black people who outnumbered these two monarchs you're talking about, who fought against slavery in Central Africa, in Azania, and all over all over West Africa. So you need to you need to know who they are, and need to know who you need to know. It's not a blanket statement. It, it's you need to know, brother. Specifically, going into specific people, it's not a blanket statement. Absolutely not. You need to you need to know the facts because see that's dangerous and and it's a it's a contributing factor to white supremacy mythology and anti-black considerations for you to blanketly say that black people sold black people and not know the whole story and not be able to get specifics. And when I mentioned Queen Nzinga, who was one of the successful queens who fought against um, slavery, you said, well, they all were doing the same thing. So you don't know who Queen Nzinga was. And you probably don't know who, who Toussaint L'Overture was, even though you're from Haiti. How do I not know who Toussaint L'Overture is? <laughs> well, you don't know who Queen... I'm not here to, to, to go back and forth in terms of what books I read. I'm, I'm trying to really fix out what, what's, what's going to be... Right. You know, and I'm asking and you like to know about the slave trade with the same level of apparent knowledge you have about Dessalines and Toussaint Le Overture. And right now I'm not getting any evidence that you know any specifics about the slave trade. I know them, I studied it. And I know who the monarchs were who quote unquote sold their people. I know how the whole situation happens. happens. And Cleo, Cleo and that's that, important. That, uh, nope, nope, Linda, we ain't even going there. That's gonna be our next conversation because this call will go on indefinitely. Um, this has been a wonderful, wonderful exchange, and I love the energy around it, which tells me that it's a conversation. What I say, if it's a, if it's an uncomfortable conversation, it's a necessary conversation. I don't know that this was an uncomfortable conversation, but clearly the response shows that this is a necessary conversation. And Cleo, you know, thank you for, you know, imparting with us. And, you know, I, as soon as we got into it, I think it was Linda who was like, we need a part two. I'm like, can we get through part one first? <laughs> so there's just so many issues though that we need to talk about. And I love that we were able to address them here in a way that was respectful to one another. Um, and hopefully, hopefully people are walking away um, enlightened about something that you didn't know before, just another way to think about it, because I promised you in the email that it would be thought provoking. And I'm hoping that that's what we did. Um, and we got to hold each other accountable. I, I think, Cleo, you didn't stress that as much as I do, but we need to hold each other accountable. If we know people aren't showing up as they should, or if they're perpetrating, we need to be real intentional about not welcoming them to the picnic. Uh, you know, I say you're not welcome to the barbecue or the NAAC picnic or the church picnic. Like, no, you cannot show up at the family reunion and talk about this great job you have and 
and without being to be able to say what you've done for the people in your community. You haven't done something for the people in your community, then so what? You have a great job. Who cares? Um, but anyway, Cleo, final words are from you. <laughs> okay, well, this is inspired by Helen and her picnic metaphor. I don't know if you, any of you ever heard of The Drop Squad, the film The Drop, the Drop Squad. You might want to check it out. Um, it stars, um, um, God, I forgot, who these, but it's, it's fine. It was pretty, it was directed by Spike Lee. It's a movie that white folks do not want you to know about, but it's called The Drop Squad. And I mentioned that because I'm different from Helen in that I want create, let me think a nice, a more nice poetic word. I want conflicted black people to come to the picnic. I want conflicted black people to be right there so I can lovingly, not hostily, ask them what's going on. And when they talk about their white jobs at the family unit, which I've actually seen, I have some relatives from Seattle and all over the place have done that. I, and I'll ask them nicely, not, what, not my neck going and not being able to sling my hot dog at them, uh, my vegetarian hot dog. I <laughs> say, <laughs> I ask them, so what are you doing that's helping you as a black man? That specifically affirms you as a black man in, in, in your legacy. And I don't say what attitude I say, it, and I'm and I sit in that way. And, and, and they'll say, and I'm gonna end with this because this takes this gonna take all day. They'll say, "Oh, here we go with that black stuff." And I'll say, "Yeah, because black people should have black stuff. White people got white stuff." Mm -hmm. And it, I get the impression from you that you're in, you're in their white stuff, yeah. Yeah. and you're too, you know, conditioned to value that to value black stuff. But as a black person, yes, I value black stuff, and it's intelligent for any group to value their own stuff and almost every group does but we've been trained not to value our stuff and I, and I and I let them know I value and I love you too and that disarms them instead of me getting all of a sudden and, and making them feel bad so you I can let them... have that conversation with Kansas Owens, Clarence Thomas, Condoleezza Rice. Well see now you're going outside of my family reunion. Oh, I'm just saying. Uh, I would I I would have a conversation with them. I absolutely. I'm not sure it'd be the family union, but I would love to have a conversation with all th all three people. Trust me, I've had conversations with black people like that, not necessarily on TV, and I've I've had conversations with black people who used to not touch black people with a ten foot pole, who now only who only now only deals with black people. So that's a whole other conversation. But yes, I would talk to them. Yeah. All right. Well, this has been fantastic. Um, Chip has been more than gracious hanging out with me because he's been sending me messages like hell. Uh, <laughs> I heard you, Chip. Take care, Pierre. What'd you say? Oh, okay. You I'll, I'll tell him my, my, my brother okay. from Haiti. Take mm -hmm. care. And I Pierre will be back. Time. This is the second time. He'll, he'll be back. I already know you're going to come back here. But so, and Cleo, you and I can talk about what's the continuation. I think this is a conversation that definitely needs to go on, and we'll have to figure out what that looks like. But I want you, Cleo, can you please leave in the chats or send it to me so that I can get it out to folks because you kept talking about your classes, but you didn't have, you should have had what's a, um, Melissa on here dropping your stuff or giving it to me to be dropping it in the chats. Because, you True. know, I, I, I want to take your class. <laughs> so. Well, I'm going to make sure that you're informed. Um, because of COVID-19, our classes stopped that we used to have at our center and, and we're doing some things on the internet, but we have a whole series and curriculum that's coming out in 2022. So we will keep you informed. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter. They took my, my account down, so I had to put a new one up. I was too black for them. But you can find me on Twitter. You can find me on Instagram. You can find me on Facebook. Join me, be a friend. You'll be able to see what comes up in my work and when we're going to be doing our classes if you do that. Um, you can go to the amasi.org. Um, website. I'm not on Black Twitter. I got I got to find out about that and go to that. I've never even seen Black Twitter. Um, but my website that has a lot of my work is called Amasi.org. Amasi is spelled Apple, Mary, Apple, Sheila, Sheila, important. Amasi.org. And you can also ask for about class information. There it is. Thank you. You can also ask about our classes at info, info at Amasi.org and we will keep you informed what we're doing and I'll, I'll be back on the Higgy show. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we don't even have a name for it, but it's when black women gather and we always, look, 
When and our and, and our tagline is when black women gather, amazing things happen. And I think this was an amazing evening with great information.